Okay, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm on a call to order this meeting of the Commissioner's Court of Hood County, Texas. Today is Tuesday, December the 8th, 2020. It's 9 a.m. We're in the Century Jury Room of the Hood County Justice Center at 1200 West Pearl Street, Granbury, Texas. Today, we are pleased to have with us the illustrious Dr. Bill Miller, who is a member of the Pastor Council. And this Pastor Council is composed of some very fine gentlemen and spiritual leaders here in Hood County. And this group has gotten all of the speakers together for our invocations here throughout the years. We started this in 2019 and through 2020. And Dr. Bill Miller is the one that does all of the hard work about doing this. It comes with the blessing of the pastoral council, but this guy right here is the one that does it. And I want you all to know that he does a good job. And I think that every Christian church really in Hood County has spoken and come here to the commissioner's court to let them know that they're important, their members of their congregation or church are important and an important part of Hood County. So it's, I'm, it's honored, I'm honored today to call to the stand Dr. Bill Miller, who's also a very dear personal friend of mine. Dr. Bill Miller, please stand. Wow, what an introduction. <laughs> I just want to point out before I pray that the original schedule for this morning called for Pastor Larry Dixon to give you the invocation this morning. Since he's occupied right now doing some really important stuff, I'm really proud as his friend to stand in for him. He was Assemblies of God pastor for 50 years, and 31 of those years were spent right here in Hood County. So it's my honor to pray this morning. It's a special, special moment. Father, I just want to thank you for this day. And I lift up, God, our leaders. Your word says that we should pray for our leaders. And by doing that, God, you have promised us that we will have peace in our lives. That's what your word says. And so I decree that word today as I lift up our leaders, men and women who lead this county, the, this court, our first responders, our law enforcement, our caregivers, God, all are in the group of leaders that make it possible for us to lead peaceful lives. I lift them up to you today, God. I thank you for what they've done for us this last year, which has been a difficult year. They've made tough decisions and sometimes in the face of criticism, but they made the right decisions. And Hood County is a special place, God. I thank you that, that we can live in Hood County. It's not like the rest of the country. You can look around and see a lot of worse places to live than Hood County. And God, I pray a blessing over Hood County. As I thank you for this past year, I look forward to the future, God, to next year. And it won't be an easy year, but I pray that you would give wisdom to these leaders, give them knowledge beyond their own abilities, God, empower them to keep Hood County, God, the, at, at the level of quality that it is today. I pray that you would bless each of them, bless their families, bless their finances, bless their homes, bless their ministries, God. Bless everything they put their hands to, and I thank you for this opportunity to pray for them today in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Hey, now, would you uh, join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, Indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please call your name. Honor Texas flag. I pledge allegiance to Texas, one state, under God, one and indivisible. <coughs> Thank you very much, Dr. Miller. Thank all of y'all. Okay. We have no pres special presentations today, but at this point, I want to tell everybody that if you want to speak, on any item on the agenda, please get a public participation form from Sheriff Deeds right now, fill it out, give it back to the Sheriff Deeds. He will hand it to Katie Lang, and Katie Lang will number them. And the public gets a maximum of 30 minutes to speak on any item that's on the agenda, and you will be listed and 
we're going to try to give everybody an opportunity, but I need to know how many people are going to speak so I can divide the 30 minutes for the people that are for the agenda item and the people that are against the agenda item, and then divide it according to how many people are, are there to speak for and against. So please, if you're going to do it, don't wait till the last moment. Get the public participation form, hand it to the sheriff. The sheriff will give it to Ms. Lang. Ms. Lang will number them and give them to me. So far, I only have two. One to speak on item 11 and one to speak on item 3. And with that, that brings us to next to the consent agenda. Do any of the commissioners wish to pull anything from the consent agenda? Uh, yes, Judge. I do have a couple of issues I'd like to pull from the consent agenda. Uh, the first one is uh, under the sheriff uh, accepting a donation from Hood County Animal Control <clears throat> in the amount of $5,000 in merchandise. Uh, I think the sheriff wants to speak on that, so I want that to come up. And then after that, I have another item I'd like to pull under item F, purchasing, and that is uh, to request approval for an annual renewal of RFP 2018-007 Fleet Management to Granbury Tire. I'd like to speak on, have that speaking and pulled from the consent agenda. Was it the 1115 waiver money? Uh, that's not it. <clears throat> I thought we had discussed something about the, is the 1115 waiver money not on the consent agenda anywhere? No. It is not. Okay, I wanted to make sure that that went. So just those two items. Yep. Okay. Sheriff, do you want to address the item that C Commissioner Cotton brought up? Yes, well, I just wanted to bring it to your attention that we've had two very big donations made to animal control. The, the one for $7,000, that's, um, you know, we've got some big checks in the past, but this is a, one of the most, the biggest checks we've got in a long, long time. Um, so I just want to bring that to your attention. People are really excited about what's going on out there at animal control and willing to step up to the plate and help. And then uh, number two on the consent agenda, the, in the, the $5,000 of mer worth of merchandise, this is coming from Pet Sense. And final tally this morning, it's going to be closer to $20,000 of merchandise. And so we've got a truck leaving. They've already left this morning to go down and pick up the stuff out of Austin and bring it back. But they're closing down a store down there. And a year or so ago, they did the same thing with us. They closed down a store, maybe it's been two years ago, up in the Metroplex, and they donated a lot of items to Animal Control for merchandise, pet food, a lot of different supplies. So it's not a check, but it's it's worth a whole lot of money if you had to go out and buy all that stuff. So um, Pet Sense has been a great partner to us with the store up there on Morgan Street, we um, are able to adopt out a lot of cats over the years since we had that going on. And um, really, it was great for saving cats. They haven't taken any dogs. They just want the cats in there. But uh, they've been a great partner. And, and today, um, you know, just shows how great a partner they are. So I just wanted to Here's bring that on up. That, on that item one, is, is the Vernon, is that the, I don't know if I can pronounce the last name. Is that the one? Excellent. Okay. Okay. Good. I was worried about pronouncing that and yeah. massacring it too. So, <laughs> thank you, Judge. Are, are they in the? Uh, are they here or, or maybe not? No. Anyway, I, I like to recognize them as you know a nice donation, seven thousand dollars. I yeah. couldn't pronounce it either, so yeah, I was that's, trying to stay away from it. And would you please tell Sergeant Kelly McNabb? I'm sure that she is in the process of writing a very glorious flowery thank you sincere <clears throat> thank you to both of these this individual and to this company i'm sure she does that right yep oh yeah so we're we're blessed for all the the good people out there in hood county and companies that get behind us too so perfect just wanted to make sure you knew that and just didn't read over it so good deal so it's actually like i said on that number two it's closer to twenty thousand once the final tally was this morning, and they're on their way back, or down there to get it, and it'll be back up in Hood County this afternoon, but they said it's closer to $20,000 worth of merchandise. Great. That's Great. Fabulous. Okay. Thank you very much, Eric. Thank you. Thank you for running a good facility out there, too. Oh, yeah. Didn't do it without the staff. Okay. Okay. 
That with those two, then do I hear a motion? Well, I want to talk about. I want to. Can I, you want to pull it now? Oh, oh, oh that's uh, uh, the they, uh, under purchasing. Yes. Uh, We've got this, uh, number one there says request approval for the annual renewal of the fleet management to Granbury Tire. I thought we were having some trouble with Oh, we are. We are. I was waiting for Delton. Uh, Delton called me the other day and had an issue about a front end alignment there. And I've been waiting to hear from him. I even told him, I said, this may be the final nail in the coffin, so to speak. So Not nobody else we can, is there anybody else put in for the maintenance? contract no. well no because it's just a renewal they originally won the contract we have a one-year contract with four renewals the only thing I can do is to notify them that we are going to end the contract give them the proper notice that's required from the RFP and then rebid it out we had no one that put in as an alternative this time usually we have a one or two alternatives but nobody put in for it I thought our drive was interested they, they are and there's been another one where Cordy's used to be I don't know the name of the place right offhand but they are interested as well as well as um, whoever took over classic Chevrolet yeah, that's a wonder that the Chevrolet dealer we've got all Chevrolets you would think that they yeah didn't win. yeah he is interested so okay. I mean we could bid this out and and do it there a, you know. Is there a, a specific amount of time we have to give the uh, Granberry Tire? Or Generally on RFPs, it's either 30 or 60 days notice. So you would just notify them that we're going to go out for bid? Yes. I would have to bring it to court, get y'all to agree that we are going to end the contract. I would send the letters, and then 60 days we would be done with it. I know it doesn't hurt to, uh, competition's good. You know, yes. It yes. Doesn't hurt and to go kick the, you know, go kick the tires and see what else is out there and give everybody everybody an opportunity and just. I, I know Lynn McDonald has worked at trying to find someone, and I have too, and that's where the Pirate Drive came, and that is also where uh, Classic, whoever owns that now, I think it's Jerry's, maybe. Yes. Okay, Jerry's yeah. has expressed interest, and then uh, someone, like I said, that used to be Cordy Tire. I don't remember what they are now. Maybe I. Mean, I'd, I'd be scared to even try to venture a guess, but I have them on my vendor list. Uh, they came in one day just off the street and were very interested, so. Judge, with that, uh, that's a, we're gonna pull that out. We're not gonna, we're not gonna approve the, uh, the annual renewal. We'll go back out for bid, and with those two items in, uh, I would make a motion to approve the uh, consent agenda. Okay. Could I explain something though? Yep. If sure. we don't have a contract, our spend is usually close to, if not over $50,000 a year. We will have no one to work on the vehicles. We need to leave so them in there the until contract. I can cancel it. Oh. So we need to move because it comes up at, in less than 30 days, right? First of the year? Yes. But then you can turn around and give them their 30 days notice. I can give them their 30 days notice at, after we decide we're going to do that, 30 or 60, whatever it is. Okay, so we're not locked in for another year if we approve this? No. No, but sir. However, we're agreeing we're going to do that? Yes. Okay. Yes, I have no problem with yeah. that. I guess it, I don't think we need a motion to do that. We'll just we'll then leave that on the agenda, yes, a sir. consent agenda that you're going to go ahead and renew the contract, but at the same time, you're going to give them their, their notice that we're going to take back out for rebid and cancel their contract. Right. I have, I have talked to Mr. Huff at Granberry Tire a few times, and I know Steve Smith has as well. So I, I don't think it'll come okay. as a surprise. Okay. okay. So, but we're not, we're not requesting approval of this contract. Well, I don't know. we have to because we have We have, have nobody to, to work on. in order to continue to send our car somewhere to be repaired because of the cost that is required <clears throat> that we bid it out. So if you don't renew it, you have no contract. And we can't get a new one quick enough to take over before January 1 when this one went, right? That is correct. Because I have to advertise it in the newspaper for a total of, of 14 well, let's days. let's do everything we can because things have come to our attention that I'm not very pleased with. I can have that by the next court for you guys to um, give me approval to 
end it. I can have the bid ready to go out as soon as y'all do that. Okay, well, let's have it ready to go out. And I will do that. Can we vote on it then the next, on December the 22nd? Yes. Okay. And actually, if you want to take this off, you can because it doesn't come up till the first of the year. So we can just pull the item. Pull the no. item on this this one. The second, we can approve it until or get it. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. So if we pull it off now, so the, I think the motion you want to. I'll make the motion to pull item uh, under purchasing item one request for approval for the annual renewal. <clears throat> Motion been made by Commissioner Cotton to approve the consent agenda with the exception of item F1 under purchasing. Uh, and with that, do I hear a second? Second. Second by Commissioner Eagle. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Motion carries 5-0. This brings us down to business to be discussed. The first item I see Mr. Don Linney here, but for Christmas he's given us a present. No world ops, right, Mr. Lenny? Right. Thank you, sir. Okay. This brings us to Mr. Clint Head under development. Mr. Head, good morning. Good morning, Judge. Good morning, Commissioners. Development's accepted an application for a replat of orchards on the Brazos, lot 14R in Precinct 2. Staff recommends setting the public hearing for January 12th, 2021. January the 12th mm -hmm. of 2021. Okay. Judge, I'll make the motion that we set a public hearing for the following replats, uh, Orchards on the Brazos, Lot 14R in Precinct 2 Second. for January 12, 21. Second. Motion's been made by Commissioner Cotton to set a public hearing for the Orchards on the Brazos plot for January the 12, 2021. Second by Commissioner Eagle. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Motion carries 5-0. Next, we have a public hearing for a replat of Orchard 12B, Lot 3425 and <coughs> Reserve Area A1. This replat is being done to adjust the common lot line between Lot 3425 and Reserve Area A, creating a 0.785 of an acre lot called 3425R and a 3.319 acre lot called Reserve Area A1. The property is located in the Water Quality District and served by EMUD Water and Sewer. But this time we're going to convene into a public hearing to discuss and consider the following replat Orchard 12B, Lot 3425 R and Reserve Area. What do you have for us? I guess there's nobody to speak, so. Nobody here to speak on it? Staff has reviewed the replat. All comments have been addressed and recommends approval as presented. You recommend approval? Staff recommends approval. Okay. All right, now we're going to reconvene back into Commissioner's Court to consider this. So do I hear a motion? Yes, Judge, I'll make that motion to uh, approve the following replat in Orchard 12B, Lot 3425R, and Reserve Area A-1. Okay, motion is made by Commissioner Cotton to approve the replat as stated. Do I hear a second? Second. Made by Commissioner White. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries 5 0. Thank, Thank you, you very much, Mr. Head. Okay, now we come to financial. Ms. Becky Kidd. Good morning, Judge Commissioners. For this court, the expenditures are $264,823.06. The Auditor's Office has reviewed all these invoices and recommends payment. And additionally, if you have any questions regarding invoices over $10,000, just let me know. Make a motion we pay the bills. 264823.06. Commissioner Eagle gets right to the point, doesn't he? <laughs> okay, Commissioner Eagle has made a motion that we go ahead and pay the bills in amount of $264,823.06. That has been approved by Ms. Becky Kidd. Do I hear a second? Second. Second by Commissioner Deaver. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Motion carries 5-0. Thank you. Before you leave. Yes, sir. Would you please give us an update, if there is any, on how much money we have gotten from our portion of the CARES Act 
what two we million. Call the Jay Webster and doing the proper forms. How much money is in our bank? Not near money, like we say in El Campo, <laughs> money in the bank. Becky Real did. money, two million five hundred twenty-one thousand thirty-eight dollars and sixty-four cents. Pretty good. Congratulations, Jay Webster, doing an outstanding job. Okay, now this brings us into miscellaneous. <laughs> okay, and the first item on miscellaneous is discuss and take appropriate action for the county to support the Clean Air Coalition with an annual payment and the amount of $35,000 to be paid out of Fund 10 General Administration Contract Services. Who is going to speak on that? We got anybody here from Clean Air? Uh, we've got, uh, Judge, we've got uh, Mark Franco, President of the Clean Air Coalition, and uh, Michelle McKenzie, who is runs the show, I don't know what you, I can't remember your title, but she she runs the place, so <laughs> <laughs> kind of give us an update on, on what we're doing and why we're doing that. So we, um, take this off so y'all can hear me. Um, back in June, we came to the commissioner's court because we ran short on funding. We're uh, grant funded and our grant did not cover all of our administrative costs. And so we came to the court to ask for help. Um, and we've, we've approached the city of Granbury, Hood County, the city of Crescent, city of Toler, Granbury ISD, city of Cor De Cordova, and city of Lipan. Uh, we did get a commitment from the city of Granbury for $25,000 plus $10,000 of in-kind services as they're providing an office and phone and all that good stuff. Um, city of Crescent was able to provide $2,500 in funding. The Granbury ISD came in with $5,000 in funding and city of De Cordova provided $1,000, so we're, we were able to get some assistance with that, but we we're still a bit short, so <laughs> we're asking for the county to... The Rider 7, uh, is, is it completely ran out now that uh, we're not, the state's not providing us any more funding on that? We have um, funding from the state. It's 200 and... I'm going to say the wrong number. 81000 thank you, $250. Um, and we're still using that funds through the end of December 2021. Right. Um, but as we said before, the only $28,000 of that can be used for administrative funding, and so that doesn't quite cover the bills for that. Or you need, we, you all were needing 70000 weren't you? It was a total of 70000 that we had were asking for at the beginning um, with the funding that was proposed. It was $70,000, and then we weren't quite able to get as much funding from some places as others, so we went to De Cordova and asked for an additional 1000 from them. Um, the actual funding that we have right now is going to come to 33500 that we've got approved. Um, and so with the additional 35000 from the county would give us 68500 so it would be really close to our seventy. I think the city and the county are both behind this project. You know, we are under uh, attainment now, uh, and it we need for it to stay there. Absolutely. And if it ever happened that it would go back up, we'd be in real trouble if we didn't Absolutely. have this organization to explain what we're doing and how we're doing to try to keep this Absolutely. in attainment. And we are in the process right now. EPA is, they've proposed leaving the standard set at 70 parts per billion, but that is not a finalized decision yet. So we're about to start into that whole designation process again. We are lucky enough that right now we're sitting at a design value of 66 parts per billion, which is comfortably below 70. So we're, we're in good shape right now, but that doesn't guarantee. Or unless they change if the. They, yeah, if they lower the standard, then we're right, right. back in the mix. <laughs> I have a figure of what it would cost the county if we were in non-attainment when you go to uh, do inspection. The, just for the state inspections on the vehicles, we estimated based off the number of vehicles in the county was about $1.8 million a year for total cost for all residents and for the vehicles registered for the county. It's an additional, I think, 25 to $35 per uh, vehicle that has to be inspected for that emissions test. I know when I was on the board back several years ago, uh, Obama raised the numbers, made it hard on us. When Trump got in, the numbers kind of declined. So we got another, we got Biden coming in. I, I see the numbers going back up. It's going to make it hard on us. But the, the last standard was set in 2015, and that's when it was lowered to 70. Yeah. So and we're um, 
It's so, it's po I mean, possibility you, you of it see being what lowered I'm saying, again. Yeah, there is a chance. I think it's going to happen. <laughs> I'll wait for the judge and then make a motion. <laughs> <clears throat> okay. Is there anybody has any comments or questions to these people here? I think you did a good job. But good job of explaining it, Judge. Well, bad things happen if we don't pass that Clean Air Act. I do know that, and that comes back with a lot of penalties and everything. So. With that, with, with I that hear judge, a motion. I, yeah, I, I'll make the motion, Judge, uh, to uh, support the Clean Air Coalition with an annual payment in the amount of thirty-five thousand dollars to be paid out of Fund Ten General Administration Contract Services. I'll second that. A motion been made by Commissioner Cotton to make a annual payment of thirty-five thousand dollars to be paid out of Fund Ten, and second by Commissioner Deaver. Any further discussion? All those in favor, say aye. 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 All those opposed? No. We got four ayes and one no. So the motion carries four to one. And uh, you get an invoice. Becky, do you want the invoice? Or does it go to? Okay. So Thank you, you can do that, do that with uh, the treasurer, the auditor, and you'll be set. Thank you very much. All right. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. Okay. Item number two, discuss and take appropriate action regarding requests for closure of citizens collection station on December the 26th, 2020 to allow tenants to spend holiday time with their family. Miss Jeannie. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, the attendants at the collection station had asked if um, I would consider closing the collection station December the 26th. Um, so they would be able to spend time with their families with Christmas being on Friday. Um, I just wanted to bring it to court to get approval from the commissioner so that everyone knows that we would like to close that day if y'all would allow them. This doesn't change anything. They were all part-time, so there's no holiday pay or anything in that sense. It's just a formal request to allowed to close it, we'll post it out there, and then I'll have um, IT assist me with getting it posted on the website if y'all approve it. That's gonna be my question, make sure we post that thing, people know it's gonna be, if the court decides to close, so. You recommend it for morale speaking? Yes, they um, I work the Friday after Thanksgiving every year, and then they'll this year with New Year's falling on the first, they'll also work that Saturday. So this has tied up most of their holiday time, and then they both requested that. Okay, well, do I hear an, a, a motion? Yeah, Judge, I'd like to make that motion uh, to allow the Citizens Collection Station to be closed on December 20, 26, 2020. And made by Commissioner Deaver to Second. allow the closing of the co citizen collection shaping on December the 26th. Second by Commissioner Cotton. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Motion carries 5 0. Thank you, Jeannie. Okay. Item number three discuss and take appropriate action on updated Tyler and Net Data contracts. Okay. Let's start with Drew. Back again. Okay. Six times the charm. Well, gentlemen, um, of course, we had our workshop last week, and finishing that workshop, uh, I was asked to provide an apples to apples comparison for a price for NetData and Tyler. And of course, I've already given that information to you, gentlemen. Um, so you uh, have a total at least at the bottom of that page, of what it would take if we do decide to move the whole county, if we partially move the whole county, or we stay where we're at. Now, I am still waiting on numbers back from that data on certain things. Um, there are a few other things like e-file for constables and JPs if we were to stay on that data. Um, and I know uh, Clint with development and planning, he needed another register created. So there are a few things that would cost some more money, of course, for net data. I do not have those numbers, though. So really, it's just here. And, ad and in addition to that, time and attendance would go away on our present way and go to... Yes, so absolutely. Th which is not included in this. That so that's correct. additional money that we wouldn't be spending. That is that is. Okay. I'm sure we're straight So on. really, it's just a decision. 
Um, I don't. I know everyone wanted an apples to apples comparison money wise. I don't know if we want to wait until I get those final numbers for net data and put it back on the next court, or if we want to make a decision now. It's really the court's pleasure at this point. I'm going to make a motion. I'm going to make a motion that we table this issue until after the first of the year when the new court comes in. That'll give you a chance to bring us an apples to apples spreadsheet and it'll give us the opportunity to have all the relevant numbers in front of us before we make a vote. So that's my motion. Any discussion or questions about this motion? Okay. All right. The motion's been made by Commissioner Eagle to table the action on the Tyler and Net Data contracts until after the first of the year to be decided by the new commissioner's contract. Do I hear a second? Okay, motion fails for lack of a second. Okay, any other? Uh, well, actually, we have other people here. We have Dean Cheney from Net Data here. That's from Net Data that would like to speak on this subject here. Miss Cheney, would you like to come up here and take the microphone? At the clock. Oh, let me tell you this. On this item number three. Matt, come up here, would you, right quick, and say, I've got seven people that want to speak on this. And I got, well, one, four. This would be here. <coughs> Kevin, do you, are you for, who are you for here? Tyler, I got. Four Tyler, sir. I'm sorry? Four Tyler. Four Tyler. Four Tyler. Four Tyler. Oh, four Tyler. Okay, so that's. So we here for C3, and then we got uh, Judge Howe. I think he's uh, for that data. So I'm, I'm trying to separate this out. So we got 30 minutes to talk about this item, unless the court says that we need more time on here. And um, this is Tyler, and then Melissa Barnes is for Tyler. So I got one. Two, three. Okay. Danny us is for Turner. Where's that another one? Do you put those in order and count those for me? Yeah, 15 divided by 4. Mine says 3.75 minutes. Okay. Katie, 3.75 minutes for each speaker. Okay. Could we round, could we round it? Can you do that? Oh, if you can round if it you off can't, to yeah, four, run it to 4 if it makes it easy. Just round it off to yeah, 4 minutes. Why not? Okay. <laughs> round it for 4 minutes. Okay. So, Ms. Cheney, you're first speaking for NAP data. And then we'll go in Our, order which they've been presented here, so it works out just perfectly. That, it did work that's out, didn't it? Beginner's luck, I guess. Okay. Good morning, Miss. I like the way that you know did that quick math and math in your head. Good morning. Um, I will switch what I was going to say, and I'll just start with um, the numbers on uh, what Drew was given. Um, I do apologize for not Drew uh, getting you those uh, rest of those numbers late yesterday afternoon. Um, 
As far as um, the uh, plant and uh, development planning, um, there is a possible small fee associated with that, depending on um, what he's um, exactly wanting. Um, if we're providing him a new data set, um, I have my team working on that um, to figure out what uh, what that office needs um, so we can go from there. Um, it would be a, a small fee if, if there is one. On the JPE file, so we did mention last week that normally there is a cost associated, um, an upfront cost with, with an annual maintenance cost with, with that. Um, you know, can, we, we did mention last week that it would be negotiable. So, you know, the court, oh, we already have a signed five-year hosting agreement with Hood County, which we um, have visited with you guys um, and have agreed to uh, change that contract to a three-year hosting contract, keeping the, the five-year cost the same and not going up as it normally would um, uh, because it's, it was moved down to a three-year. Um, that JPE file cost for those offices, you know, that, that can be waived. You, you sign the th three-year hosting contract with us and you keep the, the CMS applications, you know, that, that upfront money goes away and, and we can do that. Um, working together, it's been uh, mentioned several times, you know, why can't we all work together and, and, and interface and, and build things to, for the betterment of Hood County? We've been doing that with Spillman. It is taking a little bit longer um, with uh, legal contracts and things, but um, now our development team is working strongly with Debbie Armstrong and as well as Spillman to take care of that action item. All other action items that were presented to us back in September with our offices, um, we've been working closely with those offices as well, getting those action items um, crossed off, which actually all of them um, have have been, if not uh, laid the up, uh, laid the path to get those resolved. Um, upgrade paths to upper court case management will be launched, a new icon product in 2021. Um, and so, I mean, a lot of our offices here are still happy. I just spoke to several offices this morning. Judge Messinas, he is happy. Now, he uses both systems, and he's happy with Odyssey. That's great. He's also happy with what he uses in my system. There's no reason to make him switch over to something that he doesn't want to. Um, our offices are, are, the majority of them are happy here. Um, and uh, you've got a lot of people that have been um, offices and county officials and clerks that use our system that are still happy and that have been um, fighting to keep our system in-house. Like we said last week um, in the workshop, Hood County's been a customer of ours for a very long time. Um, a veteran customer since 1990, dear to my heart for obvious reasons, family-owned company for a very long time. Um, it uh, doesn't make sense to me to switch over an entire county when all your offices um, aren't unhappy with the system that they use currently and um, it works their offices. The courts here are doing very well. GHS collections, the revenue over the last five years have been just over a million dollars. Uh, we talked about case dis disposition rate last, uh, last week in the last five years, 97%. Um, big things have been happening in Hood County, um, and I just asked the court to not forget those things um, when, uh, when you make the decision um, on what you're going to do. Thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it. Okay, the second person that signed up is Sherry Remington, and Ms. Remington is for the Tyler Odyssey proposal and is, in fact, the representative of Tyler Odyssey. Good morning, Ms. Remington. Good morning. Uh, I want to thank you guys again for letting me come in here and, and speak to you um, and continue working with your county. Um, I've provided you with an updated proposal. We've gone through a couple of different proposals over the past couple of, probably a couple of months, um, whether they were proposals for separating out certain offices um, to move over to the Tyler systems or proposal to move over the entire county. And so with those proposals, um, I've also included the software for the constables, the execute time for um, the time and attendance, as well as the permitting department. Um, those are all included in the proposal, as well as moving um, other offices that already use um, Tyler, such as the county clerk's office uses our Eagle Recorder and financials for ENCODE, uh, moving all of those into the cloud to a hosted solution as well. Um, and I, I just want to also go back and talk a little bit about the goals that the county set up when we started this process. We talked about wanting to make sure that you have a unified um, system for the county so that information is shared amongst all the offices. 
Uh, we also talked about the security because we do know that ransomware attacks are happening all around us. Um, we had another county yesterday that was ransomware attacked um, in the morning hours. Um, your own neighbor, Parker County, recently had one. Um, and so we know that that's happening. And we also know that it's really a matter of um, when it's going to happen to all the counties, not if. And we want to make sure that you're protected on that. And so with our hosted environment, we do have um, all CGIS compliant environments. Um, all of our data is stored then in a gov cloud. Um, and so that is secure. Um, none of our data in those instances has ever been ransomware attacked. And it's been protected. So even some of those counties, such as Parker County, um, that uses Odyssey and they experienced an attack, it was not their Odyssey data that was compromised. It was their internal county data, um, such as their infrastructure that's on premise, not their Odyssey data. And so I just ask the court to really make sure that you're considering those things, um, because we know that that puts the county at risk if you were ever to experience an attack such as that. Um, and then just. If I understand that right, yes, when sir? you said that Parker County. Does that mean when you said it's in the cloud versus they had it on premises, was there a server in Parker County? Is that how? So their Odyssey data is not on the county at all. They don't have any servers on premise for their Odyssey data. It's all connected into in the cloud. And then what they um, had compromised was their own network, their own system, so such as their email system and their website and things like that. So they had a server there, and that's how. That I'm not sure how they how their own data is hosted because that's not something that we manage for them. But here in Hood County, we wouldn't have any servers at all. It would all be hosted in the cloud. That's correct, Judge. There would be no server equipment on site. Um, everything is in the cloud. Everything is hosted and maintained by us. Then. I didn't ask Miss Cheney this, but with net data, would you have to have us? server physically located here in? No, 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 not when you're hosted, you don't. No, sir. It's, it's exactly what she's explaining. It's the same. When you're hosted on the cloud, there's no server. Okay, do you agree with that, Ms. Remington? Yeah. I see I see on your bid, what does that mean, uh, secure VPN portage device? What is that? I'm not, I, I don't know what you're looking uh, Maybe, Drew, can you answer that question? <laughs> Can you answer that question? What it, What is a secure VPN portage device? Is that a physical device? That yes, normally that is a physical device that sits in our data center that gives us connection to wherever we need to go. So we normally use that for um, a good example is like the sheriff's office for all the cars. You know, they all have computers in their vehicles. They have a VPN back into our network so they can access spillmen and all the things they need to access. So. Okay, I didn't mean to get technical because I'm not technical. Oh, That's fine. why I'm asking you. Okay, so that is a physical yes. device that we have to house yes. in Hood County. That's correct. To interface with the cloud. For, for net data. For net data, yes. For net data. Yes. But not for Tyler Odyssey? Correct. Yes, they have a public facing, so they're fine. And of course, in your, in your you understand opinion, it? which My, is I'm, more secure? Say again, Judge. In your opinion, which is more secure Tyler. from being ransomware or attacked. Tyler. Okay, I, I didn't mean to interrupt you. I'm go sorry. ahead. Go ahead. No, I just wanted to add one more thing. Um, within um, our Odyssey systems, you know, Tyler is the vendor for e-filing Texas. And so that is something that is automatically included with our products. There's no additional fees for that, as well as no additional fees for any upgrades that are made um, to your system on an annual basis. Um, those are all included with our annual fees. Um, so you don't ever get charged anything additional for those. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Now for our next speaker is Judge Danny Tuggle, who is going to be speaking for net data. Judge Tuggle. Good morning, sir. Good morning, Judge, Commissioners. Thank you all for letting me speak today. Uh, my argument right now, I would love for you to revisit Commissioner Eagle's motion to table this and uh, wait just a little bit and let her, because last time we met on this issue, I was under the impression that all we had to do was make a decision on which system we wanted to use. And that was the impression I got when I left the last workshop we had. And I would like, if, if that's not the case, I would like 
to have a little more time to uh, do some more research and present some more evidence to stay with net data, at least for our office. We're not asking everybody in the county to, to stay with net data, although it would save the county money if they did. But uh, because this is a, a pretty good chunk of change that we're talking about over a 10 year period of time. And that's my taxes, your taxes too. And so I'm very interested in getting the best bang for our dollar. And uh, I would like to just ask the court to at least postpone this till after the first of the year, let the new commissioners come in because the decision that's made, the commissioners that are coming in are gonna be saddled with that decision no matter what. So let, let them come in, make that decision, and then they, they're, it's part of their game then that they play. And that's pretty much all I've got to say because y'all know where I don't stand on, on that data. I've made okay. it clear. I'll tell you this, Danny. Uh, last last uh, week, I wanted to see all the numbers. You know, today I don't have all the numbers, so right. me personally, I'm not ready to pull the trigger on this. I want all the numbers. That's what I asked. For. That I'm I'm pretty much in the same ballpark with you. I'd I'd like to see all the numbers. I've got, you know, with some of the arguments been made today, I'd like to do a little little more research then myself. Because I've done some, and and uh, I think I'm arguing a good point with the information that I've got, and I just you know ask the court to postpone this and, and uh, wait till after the first of the year, and let us revisit it then. Well, we asked them to bring the prices, and right now we don't have all the numbers, so we don't we we don't have what we've asked for yet. Mm -hmm. And there's there's one issue too that that I don't I don't think they've considered is the collections fee. Uh, right now, with the net data and the system that we've got, that net that that collection fee is included. If we go to Tyler's system, we're going to have to hire an outside firm to do the collections. That's going to be an additional charge on top of what we'll have. Is that? You already utilize collection firms. Um, I think you use Line Barter or Purdue. Um, actually, I think you have contracts with both of them, and we work with them. No additional. No We don't use them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. County uses Line Barter. Yeah, who do you? Does. Who do you? Who does it? Uh, KP use. GHS. Yeah, GHS with the. And it's figured into the system that we're in. Judge, the county can't be out any money for these collections. So the fees are tapped on to the, the original amount. If it's $100, mm -hmm. they pay 130 The county is not out any money regardless of what collection agency you go with. Yeah. Okay. All right. That's all I've got to say, gentlemen. Okay. Unless y'all have any questions. All right. Thank you, Judge. Thank Duggan. you. Okay. All right. Next is Judge Howell. Good morning, Judge Commissioners. Good morning. Uh, I got one. I'm, I've only got one thing. I'm sorry I missed the workshop. Uh, wasn't able to come. So I, I didn't see the full presentation of everything. Uh, I hate that the motion didn't get seconded because I don't think you all have all the numbers up there to make a decision today. That's just my opinion. But speaking to the decision y'all have to make about money, I'm not the auditor. I don't know anything about proprietary funds in the county. I don't know what money can only be spent for certain things. That's y'all's job and her job. But I, always ha I, on I only have one thing that concerns me anytime we talk about money in this county, and that is that if we're going to spend a great big chunk of change, let's make sure that that money needs to be spent, that we're not spending it just for some fancy bells and whistles. And let's not spend money 
on some system or some vehicle or some road grader or anything in this county that's taken money away that could be given a raise to the people that sit at those desks every day and do the work of the county because that is our asset here in the county. All that other is just stuff. And that's all I've got to say about it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Next is Constable Kevin Scark. How you guys doing today? Thank you. Um, I didn't think I had a dog in the fight as far as being a deputy constable serving papers. When I saw Tyler's presentation, I was blown away. That will make my job so much easier, hands over and faster. It'd be nice if the JPs went to it because they can see what I'm doing in real time, see all my notes, how many times I've been there, anything I want to add to it. I can do my return after I serve a piece of paper. I can do my return from the car, prints out in my office, and the clerk can e-file it right away. So that cuts down on me having to go back to the office and waste an hour at the end of the day doing all my papers and processing. But overall, I was just completely impressed with Tyler. That's it. Good. Thank you, Kevin. Okay, next is Kristen Hicks. Ms. Hicks. I'm not as tall as Kevin. <laughs> You'll pull it down. Okay. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, good morning. Uh, there's no question as to where I stand and, um, you know, on the uh, net D versus Tyler, but uh, I have been doing research since even last week, since the um, uh, workshop on calling clerks um, all around the state of Texas, trying to find, you know, the good, the bad, the ugly, you know, of, of converting over um, the conversion process if we do go to every clerk that I spoke with it, it is a process and it is going to be difficult um, by every clerk that I also spoke with uh, and I'm talking to the clerks that that do the work every single day you know that would that are processing this information um, but they all I have I've not heard one bad thing from them on, um, you know, getting over the conversion was a bit difficult at in the beginning with any software, with anything that you're going to do. Uh, it's going to be difficult. I'm not saying it's going to be a piece of cake, but they are all 100% completely satisfied with the switch that they made. And every county that I did speak with, um, they went countywide. It, it wasn't just the JPs that went. It was, and they were all very hesitant in the very beginning as well from uh, moving over to, to the Odyssey program because of what they have been told, you know, in the years before was that the JP Odyssey program was not very good. And I was told the same thing as well. Um, but they, Tyler has came a long way in the JP. They, they did mainly start focusing in the beginning with the district and county clerks um, programs, but they have, they have developed and, and started catering to the JPs as well. And, um, you know, they're, every clerk that I spoke with was, was just very extremely happy with the conversion and how smooth the process from the beginning to the end of, you know, just even from warrants, from service like uh, Kevin's talking about. I mean, just the immediate data feedback is, is great. Um, <laughs> And then the, also the other thing I was going to say was right now we currently pay extra to download um, the DPS tickets from net data um, to our system, JP4 and, and our court, JP3. One and two don't, don't currently do it, but that is a cost that would go away as well from Tyler because they do not charge extra uh, every month. We're paying that net data fee. We just started that um, 
three months, four months ago, um, but we're paying $2 for every ticket that we receive from DPS, whereas we would not be paying that fee once, you know, if we moved over to Tyler, that is included into the price as well. So that's, that's just basically all I have to say. If you have any questions, let me know. You're fully conversant in both net data and Tyler Odyssey. Yes, I, I have not worked in the JP net or Odyssey program, um, but I worked in the district clerk's Odyssey program, which I understand that they are uh, a bit different. Their functionality is the same. Um, we would have all of the information uh, in, in one place when we opened up that system, uh, we would have our events, our documents, our, I mean, everything when a person comes to talk or, you know, call, calls our office, we would be able to tell them, you know, every single thing. And also, I mean, I feel like our office is the information center for the county because we get phone calls for every office in the county. And if, if we don't know currently right now, you know, we're just we're just sending them on a goose chase of where where they may have a case in the county or where they they may need to go. But if we have one integrated system throughout the entire county, someone calls our office and is asking where they need to go or where they need to be, we can look up their name and see exactly where where it is in the county that they need to be. Thank you. So, okay. is that it? Thank All you. Right. Thank you very much. All right, now that. The next is Melissa Barnes. Can I say one thing on that last statement? Yes, sure. You have to take me to the second. If I'm not mistaken, I it, think that fee is a fee that, that uh, is paid through the auditor's office, correct? And then we tack that fee on to the fine? We don't, we don't tack anything on it at our office. GHS handles all that for you now, but what right. Is Purdue, and it's tapped on to the overall total amount. So right. The county's not ever out of Right. Yeah. So it, does, it wouldn't cost the county whether you stay with GHS or you went to Purdue. It wouldn't be an additional cost. Right? Okay. I'm sorry. Oh. Okay. <laughs> I just cut you off. Yeah. <laughs> okay. You did call my name, right? Yes. Okay. We know who you are, Melissa. Moore. Okay. Thank you. Right. <laughs> um, thanks for letting me speak. I'm kind of with Christian, you know my stance on it, but I wanted to specifically talk about the constable software from Tyler, and Kevin kind of hit on all the high points, but um, I was familiar with the district clerk's Tyler program, and then of course I'm familiar with the JP and uh, constables systems with net data, so I kind of understand both sides, and I've seen both sides, but when Tyler came in it last week and did a demo on the constables software, like Kevin, I was blown away. Uh, the number of forms you can create, the reports you can create, the turnaround time on, on how everything gets back to the courts a lot quicker, it's a lot more efficient, um, less paper, so there's less shuffling of paper, less need for space and all of that. Um, and like Kevin said, he can take his tablet that he already has in his truck and download their mobile version of that Tyler software and work directly out of his truck. It limits him wasting time having to come to the office to pick up papers or to return papers or whatnot. Um, also, I just wanted to say that I've been through multiple conversions in the cor corporate world, so I'm familiar with how it all works and, and that it is a lengthy and somewhat painful process, but it's worth it in the end uh, between saving money, uh, saving time, being more efficient and all of that. It, it's, it's worth all of the pain and the trouble. Uh, the other thing that I wanted to say about the Constable software is that when they did the demo, I learned that it is a standalone software. And I was afraid that if we wanted to go to it, then the JPs would have to go to it or vice versa. Um, but since it's standalone, we can still convert to Tyler and like JP4 could still stay on net data. It's not as efficient, but it still helps our office a great deal in its efficiency and, and how we do things. And we can definitely work around if JP4 were to stay on net data. Um, obviously my preference is that they would change, but that's their office and their choice. So uh, that's really all I had to say. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Melissa. Okay, the next speaker is Doug Gillum, soon to be the new JP for Precinct 4. 
Good morning. Soon thank you, Judge. Judge. Commissioners, thank you. 23 days. 23. Would you please <laughs> put this off for 23 days? I don't want to do it on January 1st when the day we get sworn in, but uh, it's my office. And, and so I'm as confused because when I talk to Melissa and Kristen, and I hear all these great stuff that Karen and, and uh, uh, Kevin say about Odyssey, I've not seen the program. But coming in as JP, my clerks, if mom ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. They love the net data. And anytime I speak with them, and people ask me, well, what do they love about it? And I ask them, what do you love about it? They said everything. It works. They know how to use it. Their, their percentages are high on it. And I keep hearing this over and over, and if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Keep them happy. And that's what I want to do is keep them happy. Uh, no, I don't have anything bad to say about Tyler. I just don't know it. And so net data, when I talked to net data, when I was talking to Dallas last week and at that workshop, I'm hearing so much information about net data and that any problem we have, they fix it, they get it fixed. And then they're asked for numbers again, and I think they were asked for numbers for today or for y'all to make decisions on that they just got yesterday or Friday. So to give you all the numbers, because speaking with Dallas, Dallas said if we went all county, to net data, it would actually save money than having it split or going all with Aussie. I, that's just what I'm told. So I'm still, I'm like y'all, my head is swimming, uh, but I just have one goal, and it's to keep my clerks happy and to keep my office running efficient. One last thing before I step down. I've been told, and I'm not saying this, you cannot force me to change to Odyssey as an elected official. Is that a fact? I, I, I tried to research an attorney general opinion. As an elected official, we go with the system that we deem that we see best fit. I would like to go along to get along and make everybody happy. I understand the big concept, all on one system down the road. But also, I'm with Judge Howell and Judge Tuggle. And, and Judge, let's, if, if it didn't broke, don't fix it. Let's don't spend all this money. Right now we have a contract, and I understand the cloud. It is a hoster, a hosting system somewhere else. It is secure for us, and it does what we need to do. So there's just a few more things I'd like for you to consider and uh, revisit the motion to table this until after the first year. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you, gentlemen. Judge. Okay. Matt, can you answer that question? Uh, I can try. <laughs> <laughs> So there's an attorney general opinion uh, that speaks to something specific for auditors. Uh, and I'm sure you've read that, Becky, uh, where there was an auditor, I think it was in Harris County a long time ago, and there's some specific things that give auditor the tools to do the job they do and to do it independently from you know, influence from the commissioner's court. That's why y'all can't fire the auditor, right? So there's some things that give her the specifics. So I don't think we can force, let's say, her to go to net data if she doesn't want to go to net data. But I think as far as everybody else, that y'all have the budgetary control and power, I think that theoretically, if you wanted to, you can. That's how I read that AG opinion. I don't have it with me. That's been a month or two ago. But that's my understanding. You and I have discussed that before. Right months ago right a while back so and, uh, and I agree with you on okay. the interpretation of that AG letter even though it's just an AG letter yeah it's an opinion but I agree with your interpretation okay. thank you okay miss kid I just wanted to bring one last thing to the court's attention. I did a, an analysis of what we pay Tyler net data since 2013. In 2013, we paid net data $402,443. That's not much less than what we would pay for the whole contract coming up. In 2014, we paid net data $155,340. That's when we converted, so they were doing less activity for the county. In 2020, we paid them $172,516. So they went up $20,000 over the years, but there were no services. What those charges are for is when they do updates. They are charging us for updates. The total cost for Tyler versus net data over the last eight years, net data was $1,516,000. Tyler was 1727000 There's just not that much difference. 
Well, and this is with implementation much? fees for Tyler to be, become our financial vendor. Well, what about going forward up here? If we convert all to Tyler, you know, let me say this. I agree with Judge Gilliman. I've said this before in open commissioner's court that elected officials, I want elected officials to have as much freedom as they can to run their offices as they see fit because they were elected by the good citizens of Hood County. I've told everybody that. I don't interfere with anything that I could, that I can. I think everybody should let the elected official run their office and then that their people in their precinct or countywide decide whether they're doing a good job or not. Now, Mr. Mills and and Mr. Eagle and I, we did look at this deal about the software because I was concerned about that. And I think we're all three lawyers in agreement that except for the auditor that this is something that we can as the commissioners do for the county to answer your question soon to be Judge Gillum. Now, what I'm saying though, if, if the conversion is made to Tyler, so that we're not paying Nat Data any more money. Is that is that correct? That's correct. But the total cost to make that conversion <clears throat> is what? How much is that? That's what Bruce is asking. Nine hundred and ninety-four. How much is it? Nine hundred and ninety-four thousand, I think. Sherry. So the total cost for the conversion. Um, not including what, you're, what you currently have. It comes to one million one seventy-seven and seven dollars That includes all of the products that we've talked about um, for the various offices um, and all the conversion of the data, all the training and implementation. Okay. And after that, what is the annual fee? Then after that, your annual fee is four thirty-seven, dollars and that includes everything that you already have as well as anything that's new. Okay. So that, that other sh So the annual fee would be about what eighty thousand more than what we're paying for both Nat Data and Tyler annual fees right now? What she just said? Is that possibly, but you have to understand if you do the upgrades with Nat Data, even though they, they're the last time we had this meeting, we talked about the e-filing, and they gave us figures that it would cost. Now today, they're going to waive that, so I don't know. But again, their fees have steadily gone up every year. We're not going to get that with Tyler. This is less of an annual fee than I anticipated, so it's going to be a wash, pretty much, if not less. Well, and like Doug Billum and Judge Howell, I mean, I'm... The first person when I ran on here, I wanted salaries to be increased here in Hood County because they were pitifully low in 2019, I think, and we worked hard and I wanted to get that up to a certain amount for everybody and I sure do like that and I like Judge Howe's deal about bells and fancy whistles on the thing, but the efficiency in what's coming, but what I am most concerned about is the security. Yes, and sir. That, that's what I'm really saying about. So now we had Parker County right next door that just got ransomware, and then we have Bowie County up in Texarkana that just got ransomware, and the way I understand it is that they getting through through a server somehow that's left here in the county. That's, that concerns me here, in which I'm understanding that with that data, there would still be some type of server left here that they could come through. That's, this, is, this is where I'm really coming from, where you tell me, Ms. Remington, that with Tyler, there are no servers, so there's no servers to repair, no servers here at all, that it's all in the cloud, like it was at my law office. I mean, you couldn't, I didn't even know, I, I didn't know where the, do you know, even know where the, the material is, the data is, which is the safest way. That's the secret because if you get hacked and compromised, I mean, I don't think Parker County is up and running full blast right now. Does anybody here know? 
If they are, I hear that they're still not functioning at 100%, so this is going on three months now. So that's my big concern, is to not get hacked on here. That's, that's one of my kind. So. While you're on that, mind if I make a comment, while you're on, no, while you're on no, that subject, fine. which that's I was going to talk about, but it fits in. You know, uh, you're, we're, we're being suggested to table this, which they, we've been doing for eight years, way before my time's been tabled. It's time to, we're not, it's, it's my opinion, we're not going to have all the numbers after the new court comes in. I don't know that we'll ever get the, money, the numbers of what security is worth. We're being told by our IT director that the security for Tyler is more secure than that data. I don't know. That's what he's telling me due to the fact that you'll have a VPN server on. Uh, so we're not going to know that. And something else we're not going to know, productivity. We've heard from Melissa and the other ones. What's that worth? I don't think we're going to get that number, guys. We're going to have to figure it's worth something. But I don't, we can, we can wait to get these other numbers of what implementation is and all that. And what I'm hearing, it's not going to be that dramatic amount of money. But productivity and us hitting with ransomware is worth a lot of money. Now, can I tell you what that is? No, but I think it's there. So, uh, Judge, that's what I want to say about it. I guess what I'm trying to figure out is the, um, what's the return for the amount of money we're going to spend? Is it just uh, productivity and, and, the, and the protection of ransomware or having our data? Protected? And again, what I'm seeing is in the long run, the Tyler payment will be less. And I'd also like to add that years ago when we implemented the ICON system for net data, I was heavily involved in that. We wanted to get all the JPs having the same account codes and titles, and it took a while, and I worked really well with all of them, and we got it done. So I know their system quite well, and it is not that much different than Tyler, and we will be there to help them because we know what they need. We know what reports we need. We know what they need. And my staff and I will help them in every way we can if you choose to go with Tyler for the JPs. I'd just like to ask Drew this one question. Drew, I mean, you're our IT guy up here. And I like you. And you passed the test. And you made us look good as a, as a county in the Homeland Security deal that was passed. And then after Parker County got ransomware, I came to you and I told you, I said, Drew, I want to be proactive. I want to see if there's anything else that we can do right now to prevent Hood County from going through what Parker County went through. And you and I had that discussion and we talked about it. And that was my really big concern because it literally shut the county down. There, it literally did. Right now, what is net data, if we had, well, first of all, just two questions. Is Tyler a lot more secure, or which is more secure, Tyler, Odyssey, or net data? Just that question. Can you answer that question? Tyler. Okay. Now, if we did a combination of Tyler and then keep, which is the way it comes out to be, is that there are three JPs, JP1, JP2, and JP4. And Katie Lang's office, Ms. Lang, the county clerk, that want to stay on that data. That's four entities out of all the other entities in the county that wants to go to Tyler. Is that correct? Is that your understanding? Yes. Is that your understanding, Ms. Kidd, as well? Yes. Okay. So you got, if those four entities stayed on Tyler, where there have to be w what's been called a virtual portal network or something that I think is, I, in my feeble mind, I look at as some kind of server that's physically here in Hood County, mm -hmm. that that's what's accessible to being hacked. So if we do a hybrid solution, and move the offices that would like to move to Tyler and keep net data for the offices that want to keep net data. They would both be a hosted solution. However, net data 
has a device that will have to be put in our server, in our data center, so we can get into net data's, to get into our software where it's stored. So we will have a server for net data to access our data. That would be the wink link then, yes. right there. Yes. Uh, can I ask you a question? Um, so is our internet connectivity tied to net data or Tyler? No. Okay, so Parker County was infiltrated through their internet and their email system. Correct. So what are we talking about here? I mean, I don't see, we have had zero security in, in issues. The security issue in Parker County had to do with the internet, correct? Correct. Because they received an email that had malware in it, correct? Correct. You, we, Tyler, neither Tyler nor net data is going to take care of that, correct? Correct. So that issue is really not on the table right now. And here's, after listening to this for 45 minutes, Bruce, my colleague right here to my right, has, and I said the same thing, we do not have all the numbers. I know that Commissioner Cotton is wanting to rush to spend money right now, and our coming in JP, I we disagree. got a JP I want to save coming money. in. Uh, I'm speaking right now. Well, our I coming in JP. You could, because you made a statement that wasn't true. Our, our incoming JP, we've got an incoming JP, we've got two incoming constables, we've got two incoming uh, commissioners, and we got 23 days left. So again, I'm going to renew after 45 and 50 minutes here of trying to litigate this deal today, which I don't see that we've come to a viable conclusion that I can live with, why don't we, I'm going to make a motion to table this again, and let's revisit this after the first of the year. That's my motion. One more time. Hey, made a motion to table the contracts for net data or Tyler. Do I hear a second? Before I second that, is there any more speakers? Can we hear those before I do a second? Uh, that, that is the last speaker. Is, okay. She was the last speaker. I hear a second. I'll second it. Table? Yep. All right, we got a motion made by Commissioner Eagle to table the contract, which contract to pursue Tyler or Nat Data, second by Commissioner Deaver. Let me, let me answer why I table this, because like Bruce said, we don't have the information today. We're going to table it anyway, table it next court or after the first. And I agree with the incoming new officials, uh, Wilson and uh, Kevin, uh, yeah, there he is over there. I mean, this is going to be a lot of money spent. I can say, yay, I want to spend the money and go away, and then they have to answer to it. So I think the new coming commissioner should have a say in this. And I'm not trying to dodge the bullet. I, I think this is the correct way to do this. Yeah, I, want to, I want to say something, Judge. Uh, I talked to Drew last week, or, and we, he explained to me that Matt, Katie, and Judge Messina need to be on the same uh, uh, either net data or Tyler. Yes. Is that correct? Yes. So they could, so Matt is up in the air from my understanding and same with Messina, up in the air. However, since the uh, Miss Lang uses net data, it would be optimal for them to stay with net data since those three offices <sighs> communicate. For, co for cohesiveness. Yes. About the table today anyway, if the way I'm talking, the way I'm thinking, we don't have all the numbers. So, I do not have all the numbers. And we kicked this, and I, I agree, we kicked this can down the road for, for years. <laughs> or and, more. Uh, and months, and uh, I, again, I'm not trying to dodge the bullet to make a decision, but we got two new court co members coming in. We're going to fix and spend a lot of money if we go one way. And uh, I think it should be on them and not the two court members going out. I like that too. Y'all gonna be sitting up here for the rest. <laughs> and I'm not trying to pass the Mr. buck. Mr. Wilson and Mr. Andrews, you're both smiling out there now. If we ain't got our ducks in a row time they get in the office. Shame on the people getting their numbers. Jack Wilson, you want to speak? Some stand up, sir. Come up here. You get a chance to speak. You got a special privilege. <laughs> and I'm gonna give you the same opportunity, Mr. Andrews. Okay, first off, thank you for the opportunity. 
Most importantly, yes, I think it needs to be tabled and both NetData and Tyler have a deadline to the second meeting in January to have all the data and it be put on the agenda for that specific meeting. If they don't have the data, they're out. That's my position. I agree. You know, they've had more than ample time. I've been here, you know, going to court now for 15 months. You know, it's been kicked this can, we've kicked it, we've kicked it. It's time to quit kicking the can. But since Kevin and I will both be in school the first session in January, the second session in January, it's on the agenda. And if the data's not here, they're out. That's it. Okay. Thank you. I'll read that. Mr. Andrews, you got a special privilege too. That means you've been elected, but you haven't been yeah. sworn in yet. Yes, sir. I appreciate the, uh, the opportunity here. Uh, you know, jokingly, I've said for a couple of months here that y'all need to get this thing done before January because I didn't want to wrestle yeah. this bear. But uh, I think it's the right thing to do. I think that it, uh, we do need to gather more data and uh, make, that, make that decision the correct decision at that time. Okay. Thanks, sir. Thank you, sir. Okay. All right, now that we've heard from everybody here uh, concerning this, there is a motion to table this. Did you want to say something no. before? No. Nope. Okay, you're just coming up here. All right, a motion has been made by Commissioner Eagle to table the decision about net data and Tyler contracts, uh, I guess with the modification until the second meeting in January of 2021. That's Commissioner Eagles. I'll make, I'll, I'll that add is fine, yeah. sure. Okay, second by Commissioner Deaver. So any further discussion about this? If not, I call for the vote. All those in favor of tabling until the, the motion about the contract of either Tyler or not that until the second commissioner's court in January of 2021, say aye. 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 Yeah, I'm going to say aye just because the two commissioners want that, and I'll support that. Uh, aye. Yeah. I, I do too. If they, I think they should be up here to share, <laughs> share this brunt, and I can have a better Christmas anyway. So that's you know, it's just better. you okay. know, with me, Judge, it's just I never really want to make a decision till I I got all the facts. That's because he's the businessman here and he's trying to visit. Well, the problem is, like you're not going to have all the facts in yeah. January 22nd. You're not going to have them. I'll have, have more than what I got right now. Well, you're not going to have productivity and you're not going to have security. You're not going to know what that number is. So, I but I'm done. We, I hope we have better answers about security. I'm, I'm, that's where I'm really coming from. I really don't want anything left up here that somebody can kind of hack into. I understand getting into emails and all this stuff, but the real information that's protected is going to be in the cloud. Correct. I mean, you can get into emails. I mean, if you get into my emails and all of our emails and some of this stuff, that's fine. It's the information that's in the cloud that's supposed to be protected. That's what you can't get at. Correct. That's what the hackers want. The hackers don't want the emails and stuff. They want that stuff in the cloud that the county's got to run on. That's what the big concern is. So please, both of you, that's what you need to concentrate on. That is just huge for me. That's a huge deal for me. All right. Thank you, gentlemen. With that, that was the funny. motion carries 5 0. All right. Good. Okay. Okay, good. All right. Thank God for this next one here. <laughs> Number four. Consider and take appropriate action on retiring Sheriff Officer G Deputy Gary Morris weapon for Texas Government Code 614.051 purchase of a firearm by an honorable retired peace officer. I make the motion that we sell him his pistol for one dollar. Sweet. <laughs> and second by Commissioner uh, White. Uh, for all the years, how many years has you been working here? Working here? 16. 16. But he's been a peace officer for over 40 years, so he's, he's put in his time. Didn't well, he used to be the teller? Pardon? You, didn't you used to be the chief and teller? Yes. And Gary, surely you've upgraded models. You hadn't carried that same pistol for 40 years, have you? <laughs> the black no. powder. Yeah. You, yeah. <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> you and Josie Wells didn't have the same revolver, did you? 
<laughs> but you've carried your weapon with you for, for 16 years? Yes. You have. You'd like to keep it? Yes. I think it'd be a nice gesture. I'd like to amend my motion by saying that Sheriff Deeds has to pay another dollar. Would you second that motion? <laughs> okay. President, going to get a receipt? Let the record reflect that Sheriff Deeds has tendered another dollar. Okay. <laughs> so the motion is made and seconded. Let Officer Gary Morrison, Honorary Discharge Peace Officer, have his service weapon for one dollar. All those in favor say aye. 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 With a receipt from the treasurer. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Thank you. all Congratulations. Have a good retirement. Thank you for your years of serving. You are a great public service. Thank you and thank you on the behalf of all the citizens of Hood County. Thank we're you. Good. We're You're missing, welcome. We're missing all of your service. Good. You bet. Like. Would you like to say a few words? Are you going to miss us? Yes, I am going to miss you. I thank the Commissioner's Court for their service to the Hood County. I thank Sheriff Deeds for retaining my commission and that I could fulfill my law enforcement career. And I think it's, uh, like I said, after, after about 40 years, it's probably time to pass on the baton to somebody else and uh, everything that I can just go enjoy life a little bit more because I'm 73 years old and so I've kind of bypassed retirement age in a sense or the, the time you should do that you know I think so it's probably time I just went and enjoyed something okay. Mr. Morris it's never too old to enjoy life no there you go okay and we know who we can get to get a good reserve don't we yeah right there you go. Yep. We'll so don't, go, don't move you're not moving from Hood County or no okay good no after that last item, he probably doesn't want to be a commissioner because I think y'all picked the wrong day to quit drinking. <laughs> <laughs> well, good deal. Well, thank you, sir, and good luck to you. You're welcome. Okay, right, thank you, you for all your years of service. Thank all right, much. good. Thank you, Sheriff, for the dollar. Okay. All right, item number five discuss and take appropriate action to approve date change for the North Texas Austin Healy Club from September the 9th, September 9th. I guess that should be 2021. From September the 19th, 2021 to Saturday the 18th, 2021. Is that correct? Is any, it's got to, we can't go be, back and see. It's, it's on the permit 21, Judge. Yeah, it's on the permit 20. Yeah. Okay, that's just a mistake here. Okay, proof of insurance has been received. Any discussion about this? Do I hear a proper motion? So moved. Second. A motion been made by Commissioner Deaver to allow the update change for the North Texas Austin Heating Club. Second by Commissioner White. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion carries 5-0. All right, that brings us to item number six. Consider and take appropriate action to allow the use of four parking places in the courthouse parking lot for volunteers to park a limo. Hmm. They know we had a limo here and accept donations for toys for tots, which is a good deal. Okay, it doesn't say which four places, but I guess that toys for tots, there's a Santa Claus and a sleigh right in the main entrance to the historic courthouse, which would be the what, south side? That's the south side. So I'm, I'm in favor of giving them four parking places and we'll designate it. So Jay Riley, I see he's not here, but I'm sure we can tack on another job for him and let him go ahead and set it out someplace that's convenient there for the children. I notice they've taken pictures in the sleigh and all of that stuff. So I'll make the motion that we allow the uh, historic courthouse, the use of four parking places to park the limo for the toys for tots. It doesn't have a time limitation to begin and end, so I think it should be now, I guess, until the 26th. Yeah, Judge, here on his permit, it says uh, 5 a.m. to 1 p.m. 5 a.m., I, did, I didn't look at, I didn't think so. That's it, that's it, North Texas, Austin Healy. Yeah. 
that's a North, that's a Healy Club. We're we're on this other one oh, okay. here about the uh, uh, the parking places. I didn't. I don't think there's a permit for that. But make a motion. Yeah. yeah. I'll second it. Yes. Okay. Whatever it was. Okay. <laughs> the motion was made by county judge to allow the use of four parking places in the oh, okay. courthouse parking lot for volunteers to park a limo or other cars to accept donation for Toys for Tots and second by Commissioner Eagle. Who could be opposed to that? So I call for a vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Good, no Scrooges here, so it carries 5-0. All right, item number seven. Discuss and take appropriate action to allow the use of the gazebo for the annual Bible reading marathon on Friday, April the 30th, 2021, from 6 a.m. to 2 p.m., May 1st, 2021, through May 5th, 2021, from 6.30 a.m. to 9.30 p.m., and May 6th, 2021 from 6 30 a.m. to 2 p.m. That is a marathon Bible reading, but let me tell you something. That is a great event. It is well known. It, I think it's known kind of throughout the world for that. I mean, we got a lot of people worldwide that come to that, and uh, that's real good. But I'm going to like the illustrious uh, raster pastor. Mike McMahon here to explain this. And by the way, this is a marathon here. I got tired reading it. Do I get to kick it off again? Please come up and tell us about this. Pastor Mike McMahon. It is a marathon. It is. Yeah, it takes 90 hours to read the Bible from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22. And we do it from that Friday morning until the following Thursday at noon. And it's, it's, it's an amazing thing. This, in my advancing maturity, I can't remember whether it's 18 years now or, or what it is exactly, but it's, it's getting right on up close to 20. And I, there is one correction, if I, if I may make it here, that on April the 30th, 2021 from 6 a.m. to 2 p.m. That needs to go to 9.30 p.m. That's, we need that whole day in there. Okay. And there are some other things that I had in the original letter. I don't know whether I, I can't remember them, frankly, all of them, but I guess I can either come back again or, or work it out. But it's things like the, the four parking spaces that we had for some of the elderly people who come. They let them park right there in front of the steps so that they can come up and we can help them up and get them back into their cars. Um, for the readers, if they're reading. For the readers, yes. For okay. the readers, absolutely. That's what we did right we there. We did last year, gazebo. yes. And, and uh, elderly yeah. 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 Elderly. Yeah, of which several of us are. But uh, then also, the, uh, I would like to put a banner across 377 coming in where the bridge is uh, out there, mentioning this for uh, several uh, days or week through in advance to let people know because we have people who come in here to visit and as they go around the square, they see what we're doing, they come up and wanna know and we have many, many people over these years who have stopped and read. We even have had people from the wine walk when we were doing it at the same time. <laughs> they would bring their wine glasses over and they'd want to have a little discussion about, you know, reading the Bible and so on. <laughs> and we ask them, would you like to read? And you'd be amazed the number of people who say, can we? They put their Bible glass, uh, their wine glass down and they come up and read and then they go away and it's, it's been an experience for them. And for those of you who have read the Bible in public, you know what it is. If you have not read the Bible out loud in public, it is an event in your life that it will, it'll stay with you. It, it, I can't explain it except it's a Holy Spirit thing. So we have been doing this 
last year, we, it takes 90 hours, 360 15 minute reading slots. And last year, when we started on Friday morning, we had close to 320 of those reading slots already filled. And together, my wife and I and some of the other folks, we read maybe, out of the 90 hours, maybe three hours, and that was it. It's an amazing event. We had people, in fact, our very first reader last week, or last year, was the judge, and then after we got started good, I have, uh, I had a reader from uh, uh, Kenya call, and he read his part of the Bible in Swahili. We had people from the valley call, and they would read in English, and then they would read in Spanish. We've had it read in German, in French, um, uh, there's some others I can't remember, uh, but it's 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 an it's an international event. I've had people from Montana call in and read, husband and wife, pastor couple up there. So and it's it's open. It's, we don't you know we come as you are and read. Now I'm praying that I'm going to go ahead and start thanking the Lord now that. By that time, this Chinese flu that we enjoy will be out of the way and we won't have to have the same kind of uh, restrictions that we had last year. But believe it or not, it, was, it went right through. I mean, it was smooth as it has ever been. So I want to encourage you all to uh, vote yay and, and I say thank you for the support that you've given the Bible Reading Marathon for these 18 years or so. It, it's uh, it is. We've had people move to Granbury because of the Bible Reading Marathon. They got to read. A fireman from Chicago came in and when we, he, he said, can I read? And we said, yes. He got his buddy and he said, I want you to take this picture. Take it. Call my wife on the phone right now and keep her there. And, and so she got to see him read. And when he was through, he said, God, if we did this in Chicago, we'd all be in jail. <laughs> So it's a great it's a great experience, and I know you all are ready to go. So I I thank you, I appreciate your support, and it's a wonderful opportunity for you all if you haven't done it to get something new in your Christian walk, and it'll be something that will stay with you for the rest of the time. Thank you. On that sign, it's going across the highway. I don't that's, know I don't know who does that. The city that's of Grand a city. That's, that's a city. city. That's a city, and we will oh, approach okay. we'll approach the city and. I'm, I'm sure that he'll have no problem approving that. Do you have the banner? Well, I can get one pretty quick. <laughs> okay, all right. All right, well, yeah, at the appropriate time, we'll talk, we will talk together yes, sir. to the mayor, and I'm sure that that will happen. Okay. okay. So with that, thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Pastor. And with that, I move that we allow the annual Bible reading marathon on the dates that I've just read from Friday, April the 30th through May the 6th of 2021, including the four parking places out in front for the readers so that they can be sure to have a place that they can park in front to read. And so with that and anything else that we need to, to have, do I hear a second? Second. Second by Commissioner Deaver. All those in favor of allowing the annual Bible reading, let's see if we get an A in that. No. All in favor say aye. 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 So the motion carries 5-0. I just want to say something else. It's kind of really important here, and I'm glad that Pastor Miller brought this up, or Dr. Miller brought this up, is that today was supposed to be Pastor Larry Dixon. They to give the invocation. You were not here for that. And I want you to know that uh, Dr. Miller and Pastor McMahon and Pastor Larry Dixon and I had a little luncheon club going on. And uh, uh, it was a prominent citizen. We were having lunch at Christina's one day and this prominent citizen comes back and he sees us up there having lunch together and he says, would you look at that? Three preachers and a politician. 
And I'm telling you, everybody in the restaurant laughed. He did. We laughed. And I went. Afterwards, I laughed too, but then I said, God, I know which one I am, and I don't know if I like the use of that word. <laughs> and our buddy Larry Dixon leaned over and said, Quattro Amigos. And I said, I like that name a lot better. And we were the Quattro Amigos, and we're going to still have the lunch with the three Amigos and think about our dear friends. So it's really kind of working in kind of mysterious ways. So anyway, what are you doing here? Items 8, 9, and 10. Okay. Sir. Okay. Back to business. All right. You want to approve your promotions? Yes, sir. It would be easier if we could just take all three of them together if that's possible. That, I think it's possible, and I think that's what we should do. So you want to tell us who we're doing here? Give us the names. Uh, well, first of all, as far as the money's concerned, I talked to the sheriff and you about this. And you says that with these promotion and moving people up, and that's because some of the law enforcement people here have been elected to public offices. So it created vacancies, and so they all had to get promoted. You promoted Correct. from within is Correct. what you did. But that the bottom line of all this is what we here as stewards of the Hood County money is, is that the amount of money is going to be less, a little less, because some of the people that were retiring and got elected to public offices had been here longer. So even with these promotions, we're going to get the promotions that y'all want, you and the sheriff want to, if, to run the office, but yet the cost to the county is actually a little less. That is, is that correct. right? That is correct. Okay, please, let's take all three of them together then. Tell us what they are. Okay, firstly, uh, uh, the patrol captain has been elected to a constable's position, so that opens up the captain's position. The sheriff has made the decision to promote the current patrol lieutenant to that captain's position. Okay. That is going to leave two lieutenant positions open, being the, the promoted position, and then we have one lieutenant that's retiring. Who is the, what's the name of the person getting promoted to captain? John Barry. I think I know a man. I see him back there. And then okay. Lynn McDonald's retiring. Right. And so that opens up two lieutenant positions that we're going to promote two sergeants to the two lieutenants positions. And what are the names of the sergeant that are? Uh, Jesse Davis will promote to one of them, and Sean Kellum will promote to the other one. Okay. So you and the sheriff are recommending this? Yes, sir. Okay. So the, again, I make the motion that we approve the promotions as stated in items 8, 9, and 10 by the sheriff's office and as stated by uh, Chief Steve Smith here to promote these individuals to their respected officers, and that's to begin effective January the 1st of 2021, correct? Yes, sir. Okay. Second. Second by Commissioner Eagle. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Motion carries 5 0. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. Okay. The last item discuss and take appropriate action regarding resolution <coughs> adopting the Great Barrington Declaration in Hood County, Texas. Let me see what we got here. Does everybody that wants to speak, have they? Have you turned in a participation form? I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I've got seven, Matt, I've got seven um, speakers that want to speak for it and one speaker that wants to speak against it. Um, so that's eight. So let's give everybody just. I, do we have to? You don't have to split it up even between the for and against, do you? No. So no. what we could do is just if we get four times. Four times get equal time. Yeah, just everybody get equal time. That's it. Y'all want uh, what? Four minutes. And your judge, if you don't mind, uh, Ms. Graft has a doctor's appointment. If you could allow her to speak first, that would be appreciated. Well, as fate would have it, she's number one on the scorecard as well. So here again, we got God in mysterious ways working here. Ms. Graft, would you please come to the stand? You are up. 
Speaker number one, good to see you thank and your you. family. Good to see you too. Good morning and thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Can you raise it up a little bit. There you go. I have a comment regarding COVID related lockdowns and how they affected the healthcare system in Texas. Earlier this year, I battled cancer and was greatly hindered by the effects of COVID-19 lockdowns. Several of my procedures, tests, biopsies, and even surgeries were deemed elective, even though they were required to further my treatments. It is unpleasant and extremely stressful to have testing delayed when you're dealing with a diagnosis such as cancer. At one point, I had to have a particular surgery in a doctor's office with no anesthesia because the surgery was immediately necessary for health reasons, but the hospital would not allow it because of COVID-19 restrictions. My story is only one among so many others and a small example of what people with medical issues are dealing with. When we restrict or shut down our businesses and services, how does it affect our citizens? How many medical conditions have worsened or resulted in death as a result of being delayed? For example, a colonoscopy is considered an elective procedure, yet when colon cancer is found early, that particular cancer can be treated quite effectively. When a person is made to wait to receive the medical care they so desperately need, we are endangering their health and their lives. People not only have to mentally prepare for medical procedures, but many also have to arrange childcare and rearrange their entire schedules around medical appointments. When elective procedures are canceled or withheld from the people that need them, the entire process becomes a fight for survival for the neglected patient. This is an emotionally draining, stressful battle that should never happen in this country. The detrimental effects of lockdowns are staggering. When we become so focused on one thing, we neglect to see the destructive ramifications of our actions. Jobs are lost, businesses close, and people die from illnesses that are easily identified and treated with timely medical tests and procedures. There have been pandemics all throughout our history. This is the first time we've ever shut down almost every area of life. In closing, I'm wondering where exactly in our U.S. Constitution, Constitution that it states the government has the power to limit the movement and activities of a free people. Based on all the above, I fully support Commissioner Eagle's resolution, and I thank you for your time today. Thank you, Ms. Graff. Okay, the next speaker is Barbara Brashear. My name is Barbara Brashear. I am the Precinct 12 Chairperson for the Republican Party. And I am here on behalf of the citizens of Precinct 12 that have spoken to me about their concerns about the COVID shutdown and how it is affecting their health. Many people have died from COVID. Many people have died from old age. Many people have died from other health conditions. Um, one's not any worse than the other. Um, the people in Precinct 12 are telling me that you're putting them in a position where they have to choose their livelihood or their government. Um, the scale goes this way. Their livelihood comes first. Their health, their family, their jobs, and they are concerned about how this shutdown is going to affect all of that. We have business people in Precinct 12, business owners, um, that have already lost their business. And I agree with Commissioner Eagle's resolution. I think that um, shutting down Hood County is not the best thing for the citizens of Hood County. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Brashear. Okay. Number three speaker, Kevin Andrews. Boy, you're getting a lot of playtime here today. <laughs> Good morning again. Uh, I, you know, I stayed up a long time last night writing a little speech and what I was going to come up here and say. I was a little concerned about the decorum as a coming in uh, commissioner. Is this really, you know, I don't want to stand up here and uh, speak before this or just sit quietly and uh, 
kind of learn the ropes and, and, and get caught up to speed on what, what I'll be doing in January. But I decided as a concerned citizen that I've got to, I've got to speak out against this. I, I spent uh, uh, the last, well, it feels like two years campaigning, and one of those things that I've stood strongly for in that campaign is I will stand for individual liberties. I will stand up for the individual's right to make the decision to do what's best as they see fit. The governor's order is an overreach. This is nine months that we're into this without a special session of the legislature. Why in the world do we not have a called legislative session to establish these laws because that's where laws are supposed to come from. This, uh, so much of this is based on, it's arbitrary. What is a 75% capacity to a 50% capacity? Where are the studies on this? Where's the science on this? There's no science on this. If you look at the numbers, the mask mandates, the different, uh, very restrictive governor's orders that have been put into place, there's no change. There's no difference between, uh, you know, what's going on in New York and what's going on in L.A. and what's going on in Dallas. These numbers, they seem to be independent of the, the mask mandates of the government overreach on this stuff. I found it interesting that, let me see, I, I wrote this down. No, well, I wanted to say this. Last week, I heard a representative from the Texas Restaurant Association say that Texas has now crossed 10,000 restaurants that are now permanently closed. 90%, well, over 90% of those are mom and pops. These aren't big corporate restaurants. These are mom and pops. This is, people have put their lives earnings into this. These are someone's dream that's closed down because of the government restrictions. I know that a significant percentage of the cases of this virus don't even know that they have it. And it kills people under the age of 55 less than automobile accidents. I doubt anyone here today even considered the dangers of driving to this meeting. But for many, it was a greater risk than they stood from COVID. Thank you for your time. Uh, Mr. Andrews, one question. You okay. said the word against when you came to the podium, but you're against the governor's order. Yes, yeah, yeah. Not Clarify that. I am not against your resolution. Okay, I you. am against the governor's order. Thank yes. you. Just making sure. Okay. okay. Thank you. Okay. Next is, is it Robert Carter? Is that? It is, Judge. You've <clears throat> been a doctor, you know. But What's that? You could have been a doctor. Oh, yeah, my handwriting, my, <laughs> my Okay. My first grade teacher retired when I, when I quit. That's a true statement. She blamed it on me, but you can see why. I'd, I'd like to thank the court for the time to speak today, and I would ask you all to consider the Barrington Declaration. And if you haven't read it, I suggest you read it, even if you don't pass it, because I think what you'll see it is a very reasoned out thought process and a very logical argument that stands counter to what the judge has done with his emergency orders. What what the Barrington Declaration stands for is, let's look at the facts that we do have in hand and how is this illness behaved and who has it struck, who has it killed, and who's not at risk. And let's protect those that are at risk. But a general shutdown starts to affect businesses, children, families' ability to see each other, communicate with each other, and communicate with their loved ones. So I would ask, to pass it if you've read it, and if you've not to read it, to really read it and consider its positions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Carter. Okay, next is Nanette Samuelson. Good morning. Good morning. I was just looking at my watch. It is still morning, isn't it? <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm going to have to, I'm not as tall as Melanie or Robert, so um, thank you for the opportunity to speak today. I speak today as a concerned citizen and taxpayer in Hood County. I speak on the welfare of our county, knowing that the consumer is responsible for 70% of the economy. Small businesses make up a large majority of the economy in Hood County. I'd like to know what science the county is using that supports locking down these businesses. In early October, the WHO stated, sorry, I've got it here, so um, Dr. David Nabarro, 
the World Health Organization, Special Envoy on COVID-19, urged world leaders this week to stop using lockdowns as your primary control method for blunting virus surge. Did y'all know about that in October? You've read that? We in the World Health Organization do not advocate lockdowns as the primary means of controlling the virus. Do not advocate lockdowns as the primary means of controlling the virus. Navarro told The Spectator, Navarro said lockdowns can only be justified to buy you time to reorganize, regroup, rebalance your resources, protect your healthcare workers who are exhausted, but by, by and large, we rather not do it. That's from the World Health Organization in October. People are fed up with the hypocrisy they're seeing across Texas, Tarrant County, Hood County, all across the United States. What science says it's okay for 22 men to sweat, spit on each other, tackle each other, end up in a pile in the middle of a field, but it's not okay to sit next to each other in a restaurant, even at 50% or 100% capacity. Restaurants can be responsible for managing their restaurants in a safe manner as they have been without government mandates. These small business owners have already invested thousands of dollars to accommodate safety measures. They are holding on by a thread and as you just heard, many of them have not. They're closed for good, mom and pop shops, with no science to support that. That's just really sad. They are holding on by a thread while none of you sitting here at this table have missed one paycheck for these nine months that we've been in lockdown, thanks to the taxpayers of Hood County. I strongly encourage you to adopt the Great Barrington Resolution and allow citizens to control their own lives, live their free lives, as they are subject to the Constitution of the United States. Thank you. Harold Granick, your Who's time. He? We're going to guess that you're the one that's against the Great yes. Barrington. Just with an email, this cartoon color record, as much as anything I'll say. <laughs> it's a picture serving, it. father serving Thanksgiving dinner instead of serving a turkey, it's two big dice. Rolling the dice around the Thanksgiving, so, okay. Uh, yesterday, thank you, commissioners and uh, judge. Yesterday was Pearl Harbor Day. Uh, I'm gonna quote numbers. Uh, the numbers we lost on Pearl Harbor Day, which we celebrate every year, we're losing approximately every day in this country due to COVID. Uh, the, I'm going to quote, uh, I was going to counter with the world, uh, the head of the World Health Organization, but the first quote I'll give so I don't run out of time is from Francis Collins. I'm quoting him rather than Dr. Fossey because he's a first class scientist. He was responsible for the uh, genome process uh, and he's uh, uh, head of the uh, National Institute of Health, the director. And not only that, but he's a devoutly religious person. So it's not just the accusation that, oh, he's a, a manager or a scientist. He describes in reference to the Great Barrington uh, uh, Declaration, this is not mainstream science. It's dangerous. It fits into the political views of certain parts of our confused political establishment. Uh, I, I'd refer people to have a fairly balanced thing to go to Wikipedia, which discusses the pros and cons of the Great Barrington Declaration. Um, and I don't have time, and nor do y'all want to hear hear that. Uh, but the Great Barrington Revol uh resolution, because we're talking about the county, is equivalent to using a uh, uh, Russian roulette, uh, but because of the numbers, rather than just one gun, one bullet in a six-chamber thing, 
let's try three bullets. Who would like to sacrifice which of their family members potentially will, will uh, lose? Sweden, I just saw yesterday, which essentially tried this approach of uh, getting herd immunity has reversed itself because it's, it's failed in Sweden. There's a country that's doing it. Uh, it lists on my thing, what am I for or against? I'm for science, and there's a lot of science on this. Uh, I know this is a, an economic hardship, uh, but we're trading dollars for lives. Um, uh, it'd be nice if we had contract, contact uh, uh, testing and tracing, uh, but we've gotten beyond almost that because it's not, this has not been well managed. Uh, uh, a little of this is like if you had a forest fire, uh, and you say, well, let's do a rain dance to try to get rain rather than using science. Uh, we have things, the numbers are not absolute, it's, and certainly the Great Barrington Declaration is one argument from very honorable scientists, uh, but um, in the nature of science, you have the counter arguments and the overweight Go to, go to the Wikipedia, the overwhelming weight of this says that we have to manage it not by just putting people, exposing and trying to get herd immunity, which we can achieve once the vaccination is out there. We're still months away from that. In the meantime, we have to use science and good judgment to uh, do this. So I'm against this proposal. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Granick. Okay, our last speaker is none other than Ms. Sharon Sealander. Good morning. Good morning, how are you? Good. Christine. She just, did Christine Leftwich speak? Uh -huh. Yeah, she's supposed to oh. speak. You wanna let Christine go ahead before me? Okay, good, come on up, Christine. I'm sorry, thank you. I'll just I got so much paper up here now. Oh, the, the, I apologize to That's you. That's okay. That's okay. All right. Thank you. Um, so I'm Christine Leftwich. I'd like to say that I echo the sentiments of Kevin Andrews, what he said, and also Nanette Samuelson. Um, I'm here as a layperson. Um, Although I'm also an educator, and if I had a student who used Wikipedia as a, as a resource, um, I would take points off their paper. So just saying. Um, anyway, um, I know that we all can agree that the symptoms of COVID are different in every individual. And obviously the, how it affects the elderly as opposed to young people, whether they have symptoms or not. Um, as someone who tested positive for COVID, I can tell you that my symptoms were essentially non-existent. The only reason I went to get tested is because I lost my sense of smell and taste, which I had read that was one of the symptoms. But for that, I would not have known that I had COVID. So um, I continued on with my regular daily activities. Um, exercise, things like that, without any significant um, detriment to myself. So I think what we're doing here when we look at the fact that I believe they're saying maybe 80% of people have mild symptoms or are asymptomatic, we are taking a blanket based on the small percentage of people who have symptoms that are severe or that are affected by it, and we are smothering everybody. We are smothering individual freedoms. We are smothering mom and pop businesses. We are smothering entrepreneurs. We are smothering small business. And I would like to see this county follow what the governor of South Dakota has done, follow what I just saw a commercial for the state of Oklahoma, which is to say Hood County is open. We are open for business, we are open for visitors, we are open for tourism. Because we have a lot to offer this state and we have a lot of businesses here that thrive on the support from people outside of our community. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, 
an album is futile in there. Well, I don't have a lot to add. It sounds like everybody's covered most of this. What I do want to add is that as I listen to things, I hear experts on this side, and you hear experts on this side, and you hear all these experts. Everybody has a different idea. I think we in Hood County have to look at Hood County. We don't need to look at over how many people have died over the United States, how many people are dying in Sweden, how many people are doing whatever. We look at Hood County. That is our responsibility. And these people are who you guys are responsible to. So when you do that, I have frequented uh, you know, many, many establishments here in Hood County, and every one of them have taken on the responsibility of making sure they have social distancing or you have been protective in one way or other. When I was in Home Depot the other day, they had little you know, plastic cubicles you go in to check it to self-service check out. You know, so I think all of our establishments here have really worked hard to try to make it safe for everybody. So when you start locking them down, as everybody has stated, everybody suffers. Everybody in Hood County suffers, and mostly the mom and pop stores. But I just wanted to say, I believe I support the Barrington Resolution. I think you have a lot of experts there speaking. I've heard other experts out in the media world speaking also similar to this. And then you hear a few on the other side. So I think we need to look at Hood County and do what's best for Hood County. Thank you. Thank you. OK, that's, did I have everybody on your list now? Yes, sir. Okay, so everybody said that wanted to speak has had an opportunity to speak. Except me. Oh. Except oh. the person that introduced the, can I speak? Oh, okay. Before we do this, does Jay need to comment on well, any of this? That's what I was just saying. I mean, I've got a letter here that was addressed from Dr. David Blocker, who is our Hood County Health Authority, that we've hired to speak on this for us that sent a letter on Friday, December the 4th to me, to all the commissioners and the mayor and uh, let me see, and, and a few other people here and the city manager, I guess, and some other people here. And I was hoping that he was gonna be here because he, as a medical doctor, well, let, let me tell you first of all, I am opposed to shutting down any business in Hood County, period. I agree. I want everybody to understand that. I'm not going to shut down any business like it was back in March when we didn't know what was going on. Now there's a lot of conflicting medical testimony and scientific evidence out there, and I agree with you, Commissioner, uh, soon to be Commissioner Andrews. There is. Who knows what really is? I'm certainly not an expert. I know this if I were trying a case in law. I would have the best experts up here and try to use my experts to convince a judge or jury to believe my side of it. But I certainly wouldn't be testifying. And what we need up here is somebody that has medical degrees or a scientific degree or something to really tell us about this. But I've got two things that I want to address. I'd like to read Dr. David Blocker's letter to all of us because it is to get both sides of the view, and he is the person that Hood County has hired or appointed to be our health authority and to see what he says about this. There is so much in the Great Barrington Declaration that I agree with. But when you brought up, somebody brought up, I think you did, Christine, about the Dakotas. The Dakotas right now are dying. They, their hospitals can't treat all the people in North and South Dakota right now. They are, you can't get treated. And so they're going to outlying states and that the surrounding states to the Dakotas are suffering because of that. They're the ones that had the individual liberties and you could not tell them in North Dakota or South Dakota to do anything. They didn't practice anything. I agree with Sharon Shelander that our people in Hood County 
they have adapted to this. I mean, you go into a business, nail salons, for example, and stuff, they're protected. They have gotten some great improvements that probably should have been there all along, as a matter of fact. But you go there, you go to grocery stores or whatever, you see everybody really trying to cooperate, trying to maintain social distancing. It's the big gatherings that you run into a lot of heartache now. That just, I mean, look at Sharon up there squeamering here. You know, we had a good friend of mine, Constable Delton Thrasher, Constable One retired last Friday and had a, a retirement party for him. And out of that retirement party, I think Delton himself was contagious and now how many people, Mr. Webster, have been infected out of that retirement party? Do you have a number? Yes, sir. We're moving mass right there. How many? There's approximately five. Five? But anyway, what is, where is Dr. Blocker? Can he not be here? Is he in? He's having clinics and he couldn't get anybody to take his patients, so he wasn't going to be able to be here. Okay. Let me go ahead and read this letter that he addressed to us. This is from David Blocker, and it's addressed to the people that I said. And what the subject is, it's regarding the December 8, 2020 Commissioner's Court Agenda, item C11, the Great Barrington Declaration, Counterpoint, and the John Snow Memorandum. Judge Commissioners, as your county health authority, I want to ensure you to ensure you have all the information in front of you as you consider agenda item C11 regarding the Great Barrington Declaration. That declaration is not based on sound medical science and is not supported by trusted public health authorities. If you desire to show an official support for a declaration regarding COVID-19 impact and recovery across the commun our community, I suggest you consider endorsing the John Snow Memorandum instead, which, origi which was originally published in the British Medical Journal, The Lancet, on October the 14th of 2020, and has almost 7,000 endorsements from public health doctors, scientists, and researchers, including myself. I have reviewed both documents and I endorse the John Snow Memorandum. It can be found at, and it has a site here, johnsnowmemo.com. A short excerpt from this John Snow Memorandum reads, continuing restrictions will probably be required in the short term to reduce transmission and fix ineffectively pandemic response systems in order to prevent future lockdowns. The purpose of these restrictions is to effectively suppress SARS, COVID-2 infections to low levels that allow rapid detection of localized outbreaks and rapid response through efficient and comprehensive find, test, trace, isolate, and support system so life can return to near normal without the need for generalized restrictions. Protecting our economies is inextricably tied to controlling COVID-19. We must protect our workforce and avoid long-term uncertainty. And then it's signed David Blocker. So if you go through and you read both of them, I'm not a doctor and I'm not a medical science. I mean, the Great Barrington Declaration has, says it has over 40,000 signatures. So, I don't know. I, I don't know. I, I just don't know about this thing. I just know one thing. I'm gonna, when I get through speaking, I'm going to read one more thing, and then I want everybody to listen to whatever information that we have on the current conditions of our hospital here in Hood County. We are in a district that is comprised of 19 counties. Am I correct on that, Jay? Pretty close, yes, sir. Dallas is one of them, isn't it? And it's a percentage of people, according to population, that are in the hospitals. And this is what shocked me because we were 
on the cutting edge. I was so proud of Dr. Glenn and Jay Webster and the people that went together that opened Granbury Schools on the opening day. And also Lipan and Toler did, I think, if it wasn't the opening day, it was pretty close to it, and have kept their schools open on in-person instruction, which most of our doctors and first responders have children that are going to schools. And if their children aren't in schools, then how are they going to be working and taking care of us? So this kind of goes hand in hand. And I just can't compliment these superintendents to the extent that they were able to keep their schools open and we've worked with them and Dr. Glenn has given us all his sanitation supplies at the beginning in February and March when we didn't have any. Hood County didn't have any, but the schools did. And we, I told Jay Webster that whatever these schools needed, all the schools in Hood County needed to protect those kids, we get those supplies, you make sure that they get them first over anybody. And I think it's been good because our schools have been open and our children have been protected. So having said all of that, I am for keeping Hood County open. It broke my heart when you had the nail salon people that were closed, but we also were able to give all of them $3,000 checks to make up for their lost income when they couldn't work for that three or four weeks there. And I was so glad to have done that for them. And now we've got two and a half million dollars in our coffers that not, it's not free money. The federal government allocated every state in the union X dollars. And then the state of Texas divided that money from the federal government according to counties. The money was there if you f jumped through all their hoops and filled out all their paperwork and could keep the proper receipts and documentation, you could get the money. Well, Jay Webster did all of that, and we've got two and a half million dollars sitting in the local bank right now to help with this COVID mess that we're dealing with. And I want to help with people. I want to get with Barbara Brochure. I talked to Mike Scott, and he told me that there was only two or three businesses, to his knowledge, that were controlled. And you told me that in your precinct that there were lots of businesses closed. I'm going to get with you after this meeting, okay? See if we can help those people out. But I want to tell you what position that I'm in. I want to read a letter from the dishes from John Hellerstedt, the doctor of the department, Texas. Department of State Health Services to the Honorable Ron Massengill, County Judge, Hood County, 100 East Pearl Street, Granbury, Texas. Dear Judge Massengill, on Wednesday, October the 7th, 2020, Governor Abbott issued Executive Order GA32, which superseded GA30. Significantly, GA32 updates the thresholds for areas with high hospitalizations. High hospitalizations, that's the key. The new definitions of area with high hospitalization is any trauma service area that has had seven consecutive days in which the number of COVID-19 hospitalized patients as a percentage of the total hospital capacity exceeds 15%. Until such time as the trauma service area has seven consecutive days in which the number of COVID-19 hospitalized patient as a percentage of the total hospital capacity is 15% or less. So all this time, up until December the 5th, we have been able to fly under that 15 percentage. Am I right about that, Jay? Yes, sir. And because of that, every time an attestation came up and we had made it and we were under it, boy, I'd sign the, the attestation calls. I would sign the forms that Jay would fill out and boy, we'd send it unto the state and we would qualify for our money or whatever we could get and that's how we got the money. Then go on, the letter says, for the past seven days, the number of COVID-19 hospitalized patients and the trauma service Area E, as a percentage of total hospital capacity, exceeds 15%. Make it in an area with high hospitalization as defined above, above 15%. As a result, 
as of December the 5th, 2020, all restaurants, retail stores, office buildings, manufacturing facilities, gyms and exercise facilities and classes, museums and libraries, and all counties in trauma service area E are required to return to maximum 50% occupancy levels, except in any county that separately qualifies for the greater occupancy levels because it has minimal cases of COVID-19 under the Department of State Health Services attestation process. That's what we had initially and have kept it at that rate all this time until the seven days preceding December the 5th. So everybody's with me. Trauma service area E includes the following counties. Collin County, Cook County, Dallas County, Denton County, Ellis County, Erath County, Fanning County, Grayson County, Hood County, Hunt County, Johnson County, Kaufman County, Navarro County, Palo Pinto County, Parker County, Rockwell County, Somerville County, Tarrant County, Wise County. That's all the hospitals in that, in that trauma service E. I want to, I got two more paragraphs to read, but right now, can you tell us what the percentage is of the Hood County Hospital right now, which is like Bradbury Medical Center? <clears throat> So as of yesterday, because all the numbers are a day behind, they were 91.38% occupied. Out of that occupancy, 40% is COVID positive. Uh, they are currently down to two ICU beds. Uh, we worked yesterday to get some more vents because they were only they were down to two vents. So I helped them order four more vents from the state, which they're picking up today. Okay. To your understanding out of all those counties that read, is Hood County Hospital the highest percentage? Yes, sir, we're number one for the COVID positive patients out of the trauma service area E right now. Now, that, Sharon Seelander, has shocked me. I was shocked. We're talking about Dallas County, including in this, and we all know about Dallas County. Um, and Tarrant County, we read that and hear that on the news all the time. That's the percentage of this. And we're down to two ventilators. And how many people are in ICU with COVID right now, as of yesterday? Um, as of the last report, talking to them, they had 11 in ICU. And out of that, uh, seven were COVID, and they were using eight vents out of the 10 that they had. Okay. They have two beds basically left for ICU. Our ICU capacity in trauma service area E is running about 92%, which doesn't leave but approximately about 200 beds. The problem you run into is it's not that everybody's not properly staffed on purpose, is there's a staffing shortfall. There's not a nurse, enough nurses and doctors going around to, to go around for everybody. The other problem with that is, is right now it's a, the doctors and nurses can write their own ticket. And so they may be working at one hospital today, but they get a phone call to double their salary, they leave. And so that's happened recently here in, in Hood County where uh, six of the nurses upped and quit and went to the Metroplex to go to work, which caused a staff shorting here. We have since backfilled them with 13 additional staffs from the state, but they're still short because there's just not enough to go around to staff the hospital at its maximum capacity. I've also heard from talking to other judges that some of the hospitals are offering as much as $10,000 bonuses for a nurse to come and work at their hospital. Have you heard that? Yes, sir. That's correct. Okay. Have a seat right there while I read the rest of this here. I'm not through with you yet. Okay. Let's go on to the second to the last paragraph. Additionally, all licensed hospitals and the trauma service area are required to discontinue elective surgeries as set forth in Executive Order GA31. 
The Health and Human Services Commission, the agency responsible for regulating hospitals in Texas, is separately providing notice directly to the affected hospitals, notifying them of the requirement to discontinue effective elective surgeries located in trauma services area E. That's all the 19 counties that I just read. If you have questions about this notice or your obligations, Ron Massengill, under Executive Order GA32, please contact us up and they got a website. Uh, uh, not a website, a, a link. Please enter Executive Order 32 in the subject line for proper routing. If you have questions specifically related to the hospital's obligations under GA 31, please contact the Health and Human Services Commission at, and then another link. Sincerely, John Hellerstadt. Well, unlike you, Sharon, when this thing first came <coughs> out, Hood County had less than all these other counties that I've just read. And buddy, when we could get underneath it, we signed whatever we got to open up whatever we could as soon as we could. And, we, and as soon as we could reach that 75%, we reached that first and we opted out and got that extra 25%. Do you think I'd like to see my friends around the, I walk around the thing and see that they're closed? I agree with you. These mom and pops that are out of business, I, it crushes me. I've been poor. I've been there. You know, if you've ever been there, I'm real allergic to being poor. I go into a doctor's office. They said, if you're allergic to anything? And I said, yes, I am. And they, boy, that doctor stopped writing right away. And said, what is it? You know, you think in penicillin and what? I said, poverty. I've been there. I don't like poverty. And that's why I want everybody to do well, and that's why I wanted to get some money to help out <coughs> Hood County to get over this. So, having said all of that, this is where we're at right now, where some of the counties, and there's some, well, Parker County and Palo Pinto County are having to send out patients to other counties right now, aren't they? Mr. Webster, yes, you come on back up here and you have to take your mask off so you're not close to anybody. Yes, sir. But the other counties already do. Fortunately, we have not have to send out anybody away as yet. No, that's not true. We transfer every day because of the fact that the hospital not, doesn't have the staff or capacity to handle certain patients that are, that are sick. So we've been transferring on a daily basis. Um, I tried to get the EMS director to come up here and speak today so you could ask these questions, but he unfortunately could not make it. Um, the other problem that ties into that Hey, guess is, we've been talking up here, and he's been up there filling in for you. In just walked Dr. David Blocker, so we're going to get to hear from him in just a second. So tell me about the... So the, the other issue we have going on is two of our EMS services are missing an entire shift due to COVID. So now you throw in an ambulance on a daily basis having to transfer a patient to Sherman, Texas, Austin, Texas, all the way up into Oklahoma to find a hospital to do that. You lose that ambulance for a day. So that's, that's been going on on a daily basis uh, with EMS. So no, we transfer on a daily basis people out of here that need to get additional uh, services. Um, we just have to find a place to do that. And it's okay. difficult. Okay. So really... I really agree with every speaker that spoke up here that everybody knows what to do. I mean, my family, we had four people at Thanksgiving. Four people. We normally have 50. That's our big time to get together. We had four, not 50, because of the COVID. And it just changed everything. But we know what to do. And if you're old and have a secondary illness or something, stay at home and get your groceries brought to you. I know all of that. I think all of us practice that. And I want our individual liberties. I don't want anybody taking my individual liberties. I can guarantee you that. And I had, anyway, having said all of that, now Dr. David Blocker is here, who is Hood County's Health Authority, to come up here. And I just read your, to bring you up to speed, I read your letter that you addressed to all the commissioners and the mayor and city council and everything on Friday, December the 4th. So if you would please come to the podium and try to tell us 
why you favor the John Snow memo as opposed to the Great Barrington Declaration, Dr. David Blocker. Well, Judge, Commissioners, appreciate the opportunity to come uh, speak. Um, Apologize for not being here sooner. I was in patient care, and, and frankly, I didn't, I didn't expect this meeting to still be ongoing when I, I had my, my uh, break in between scheduled patients. So apologize for not being here sooner. Um, I, 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 as you said, there's, there's been a, apparently been a lot of the conversation about this already today at this particular group meeting. And uh, so I, I don't want to go back and repeat everything that's already been said or shared. I heard Jay sharing a little bit about the, the stress and strain on our, uh, our hospital and EMS services. Obviously, uh, this, is, this has been a marathon for every aspect of, of our community, and not just here in Hood County, but across Texas, across the U.S., across the globe. Um, so, so that being said, we are in the midst of the second wave in our community of this coronavirus. Our first, our first wave peaked around the, the middle of July. And right now, uh, cases are continuing to, to, to rise and spread. And again, not just in Hood County, but across DFW and across the U.S., where uh, we are now, uh, we, we, the U.S. now is has, uh, known as the world leader as far as active cases of coronavirus and new cases of coronavirus. And I think a lot of that goes back to our sense of personal liberties and our desire to, to continue to do and follow what we would normally be doing as everyone gets fatigued and tired of this, this coronavirus pandemic. Um, that being said, coronavirus is a virus. It really doesn't care about geographic boundaries. It doesn't care about what, what county or what state we live in or what part of the globe we live in. If we provide, if we provide the right social context, the right, the right physical context, for a virus, a very highly contagious virus, to spread from one person to another, it will do so. And, uh, and, and so the, the problem I have with, um, with the specifically addressing your question about the Great Barrington Declaration as compared to the um, counterpoint that's been offered by our public health professionals, which has been, been uh, entitled as, as the Jon Snow, is that, that we, we know globally, um, even during the last eight, nine months of this pandemic, that the idea of herd immunity as relates to COVID-19 uh, doesn't work. In other words, if you allow, if you say, hey, we're not going to put any restrictions on the community, if folks are afraid of the virus, they can stay home and everybody else do whatever you want. If we ignore the, the known medical facts um, of the fact that if I'm six feet or more away from you, most of my communication, most of my respiratory droplets, the things that spread the virus are not going to get to you, you know. And so, and so that, that's the six foot. It's a very, very simple concept of distancing. And then the mask wear is for the purpose of continuing to provide an additional barrier. It's not perfect, but it's the best that we have in a larger social context to say that my, my droplets from my speaking, my communication, my activity are not going to get to you if I have to pass you in a hallway. If I'm walking down the aisle at Walmart trying to get groceries for my family, I'm going to minimize the risk of getting something for you or you getting something for me. That's really the whole, it's very, very simple concept. So, so the fact that those ideas are not contained within the idea of the Great Barrington Declaration. That's my core issue with it from a medical standpoint and the core issue of the American Public Health Association, which uh, again, I'm a part of and thousands of public health professionals across the United States have, have openly said the ideas in the Great Barrington Declaration specifically and those ideas of just, hey, herd immunity, if you get it, you get it. If you don't get it, you don't get it and eventually we'll all get over it. That's not good enough in light of this virus. The other specific piece I wanna bring out is that, again, the closest, the closest example that we have in historical awareness, because nothing like this has happened in our lifetimes, but uh, back when you look at the, the uh, great influenza pandemic of 1918 that spread around the globe, essentially wrapped up World War I because too many people were sick to continue fighting. And it was a global pandemic. It went through five waves over a two-year period. We know, if we, if we just look at larger communities in the United States, regardless of around the globe, although we saw the same thing there, communities that continued to practice social distancing, continues, communities that continued to minimize large gatherings, parades, and things like that, they fared much better 
in those successive waves of the, of the uh, influenza pandemic for the same reasons. Social distancing, wearing masks, isolating ourselves to what we have to do to accomplish you know, work and primary activities and minimizing the rest of it until this is over will clearly, clearly show a difference in our community just like it did across those communities in 1918 and through 1920, through five successive waves of a global pandemic virus. So historically, from a standpoint of you know, public health, from a standpoint of epidemiology, from a standpoint of what we, what we know has worked in the past, um, that may be 100 years ago, but the, the, the physical facts and, different, and, and, and distancing, those ideas still remain the best ideas that we have from a global large, large group setting um, as, as far as protecting ourselves from this coronavirus, from influenza, from the other viruses that we typically see a huge spike of this time of year. Uh, last point I'm going to leave with you is that, uh, you know, the, uh, the Centers for Disease Control and our Department of State Health Services in Texas uh, locally, they follow statistics on influenza, COVID, other influenza-like illnesses. Well, this year they've actually changed, even though we're in flu season, they've actually changed the way um, they, they look and document that to add COVID in as its own category in the influenza-like and COVID illness spread. What they saw in the, the last statistics that were through the Thanksgiving week, the last ones that have been published, they showed that across the state of Texas, which is the most they drill down when you look at the big picture, across the state of Texas, there were three documented, uh, documented um, cases of influenza as related to, to, um, to pneumonia and influenza and COVID-related deaths over that, that certain time period they were looking at three cases that were documented influenza deaths, but there were 556 deaths on the list. So when you talk about COVID impact, they didn't say all the other 553 were COVID, but clearly they weren't all from influenza. <laughs> A very small fragment were. And again, we're still, getting, we're still collecting those, uh, those death certificates, and like those take a few weeks to sort through the system. But regardless, regardless, I'm just saying, just one snapshot in time looking across the state, we continue to have Literally, literally dozens, if not hundreds, of pneumonia-related deaths. Most of those appear to be related to COVID, and that's just where we are right now in our in across across the state, across the the U.S., across the globe. So, I'll I'll leave you with this: You are the decision makers for our county. We have a very diverse community. We have a a, a community that's that's intentionally steered towards the side of those who are elderly, those who may have more medical issues than the average county around us, the average community around us in this part of Texas. I, I, think, I think wisdom, wisdom in, includes you know, continuing to keep these, this public health issues in mind, regardless of whether we have a health department here or not. Keeping this in the forefront of our minds as we make decisions that impact our community writ large. Where it's the holidays, we all have certain cultural things that we'd like to do. There's no question that between, between uh, October 31st and the end of November, through these normal holidays, we've had a huge upsurge in our community, just like the other communities around. Almost 1,000 new documented cases in a 30-day period. That account for about 40% of the total cases we've seen since all this started. How do we, how do we stop the spread? How do we impact the spread in our community social distancing, wearing masks, minimizing activities that, uh, that are not necessary to keep folks in school, at work, keep, keep you know, businesses open, keep government going. Governor of Texas has extending orders that, that are now limiting us to 50% opening on various businesses, that are now limiting some of the, uh, well, in, any of the um, optional things, even from a medical and surgical standpoint, that we're allowed to do across the state. Um, I, think, I think ignoring that and openly supporting anything to the contrary of good public health recommendations, the governor's orders, would be the height of foolishness for any community. But that's just, that's my opinion. I got a question for yes. you, Dr. Blocker. Uh, as far as businesses, it, do you believe there's, it, is there any way that you can keep businesses open at 100% and still achieve what y'all are after? Are they smart enough to 
you know, because we went through nine or ten months of this, are they smart enough and have they learned you know, what they need to do to keep people safe? So, Commissioner because White, we're talking about human behavior, right? And again, we all want to, we, we all want our individual liberties and rights to do whatever we want. The whole point of, a, uh, of declaring a public health emergency and a pandemic emergency and the whole reason we're having these conversations for hours beyond what you would normally be doing is there's clearly an impact on our community from a health standpoint, from a business standpoint and everything else. And, and quite frankly, if, if folks on their own all independently made the decision to stay at home if they were sick, and not to go anywhere but the doctor and to minimize that, that, that spread to their family until they got better and sorted it out, then we wouldn't need any of this. Uh, sadly, that's not human nature and that's not human behavior as we know it. So it's finding that balance, right, between, you know, at whatever level of society do we do, we do this. So in the case of businesses, the current recommendation is to limit the number of people in a given business or the number of tables open at a given restaurant to 50%. We're not closing it down. The recommendation is not to close it down. The recommendation is not to, to take that business away, but it is to put a, a measurable social guideline in place. Again, it's measurable, but it's also enforceable, right? Because I can clearly walk into Applebee. I mean, I've, I've been doing, I've been out with my family at restaurants and things too, right? I can clearly walk in a restaurant and see if, if half of the tables are, are, are closed off or if they're all open whether or not they're following that 75% recommendation or now the 50% recommendation or not, right? Maybe a little bit more difficult than a large business like Walmart or Home Depot or something like that, but still the idea still remains, right? Limit the, limit the, the capacity to 50%, increase the amount of spread between individuals that are, that are eating or dining or, or shopping, and that will help to provide an opportunity to keep the business open at the same time provide some additional degree of, of safety and security for those who are not only running the business, but those who choose to shop there or eat there. So, so you know, I mean, I, I understand it uh, and I support it as your public health authority. I, I support anything we can do to keep the businesses open, the schools open, the government running, because we're going to, we're, this is a marathon now, it's not a sprint. We're in for the longer haul. So closing things down for a year or two doesn't make sense, right? We closed things down initially so that we could understand a little bit more about what was actually going on with this virus. We could get some science going. We could start working on, on vaccines. We could understand medical treatments. At this point, nine months into it, this is, this is where we are as a global community, as a local community. And so keeping things open as much as possible, providing some reasonable limits from a society standpoint that are understandable and enforceable, I think, I think is an important way to go for now and for the foreseeable future, at least until we get through the normal flu season, which is from now till March. That's my recommendation. What I'm saying, this is a very complex issue with no 100% answer. That's kind of what I'm saying. There, there are experts that have, that have spent, again, decades of their lives studying viruses like this, you know, that are supporting us at the state level and at the national level, and again, I mean, that's, that's the one thing I think everyone can consistently agree on. No matter how good communication we have, no matter how many websites, how many news you know, stations we have on board, if you look at the preponderance of evidence and the discussions from experts, again, American Public Health Association, those who support us at the state and the national level, the, the physicians, the scientists, the researchers agree that we're going to continue to deal with a very complex issue going forward as far as treatments, as far as, as far as immunizations and all of that. And in the meantime, we here locally and every other small community around the globe has to, has to figure out how to keep things open, how to keep things moving in the light of this. This is, this is where we're at. This is what we know right now. And it is complex and will continue to be so. You know, I can't deny the damage that lock, lockdowns have done, you know, with the mental health and the uh, economic problems that you know, you know when you take when you take people that are already struggling and then you make them struggle even more. I mean, it's going to mess with people's uh, uh, mental status. I mean, I've seen it. You know, I've watched, I've observed this community. I've seen the fatigue. That's what's right. going on? You know, I see it with uh, with governments. That's uh, right. You know, uh, I wish I had a perfect answer for this to for all this to go away, 
you know, I know we don't, you know, I know it's going to come down to a lot of it's personal responsibility and taking care of, uh, you know, keeping yourself safe, your family safe. I know kids need, I, and this is my opinion, kids need to be in school because it's, it's healthy for them, you know, uh, and it keeps parents working. That's right. That's right. I have conversations with our school district leaders every day. Um, I also have conversations with our different private schools or charter schools and like, and, and that's always the encouragement is what can we, how can we maintain as much of a sense of normalcy for those students? How can we maintain a learning environment for those students? How can we maintain an extracurricular activity environment for those students with keeping these, you know, keeping these concepts in mind. And, and I think they've done a very, an amazingly good job, all things considered, of, of managing that. And, and, and I, I just had a conversation with Dr. Glenn this morning, earlier, early this morning, where we were talking about just that. As we get into the holidays and, you know, students go home, he was honestly concerned that there'd be more, con more issues with the students at home than when he has them at school where he can, can control the environment. Right? <laughs> you get together with cousins and neighbors and folks away from school, you actually have less control um, of those, those, those students, you know, school age all the way through college age. So, so actually that does help to maintain that sense of normalcy and, and help to keep them moving forward in their, career, their lives, their education, et cetera, and I, and I fully support that. Um, it's, that, that continues to be important. As far as the mental health piece of it, I, I know, you know, uh, Coke, Coke Beatty is our, our, our mental health uh, expert for this community and the surrounding counties, but we, we talk frequently as well, and, and, and uh, you know, he and Jay and I, and of course, that mental health piece is really important, not just for our medical community, where, again, we have to stay at work. The EMS guys have to stay at work. And they're running into the fire, so to speak, right? They're, they're going into the environment where they're, we are deliberately exposing ourselves to patients who we know are sick to try to help them get better. And that's just part of what we do. But the, there's, there's obviously a, a continued impact on that and fatigue there and, and strain on our system, as you were sharing earlier, about limited resources, limited numbers of beds, limited uh, n amounts of uh, you know, ICU beds and respirators and ambulances and people trained to drive those ambulances to take folks around. But, that's part of a larger issue that we share with our surrounding North Texas community. And thankfully, we have a lot of folks that are working together to try to help manage that. And we'll continue to do so, right? And so that's, that's one, one saving grace of us being so close to the Metroplex and like is that we're tied in and we're leveraging those resources as much as possible. But the mental health side and the fatigue and folks being tired both, both on the medical community, across the workforce, across, across our community, um, continues to be extremely important that we socially distance, but that we're not emotionally distant from one another, right? That we're not, you know, if we can't get together with families the way we normally would over the holidays, we still communicate with families. We still see families. We leverage the technology. We leverage what we can to try to help, help encourage and keep one another's spirits up. I just got one more question. On yes, sir. I, uh, in your opinion, with, regarding our hospital, on a scale of one to 10, where, where are we at and uh, are we at, nine are we at critical stage and eight or what would you i mean do you have any idea what i'm asking so there are different ways to measure that um, i think jay you already spoke to where we sit in 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 terms of the number of covid cases the percentage of covid cases and where we stand on the across the state and we have exceeded that threshold as far as strain on the system. The number of active COVID cases uh, at any given time in our hospital and, and what that looks like even over a seven to you know, 30 day period, we're, we're above the danger zone right now in our community. Um, and, uh, you know, and unfortunately that's, that's where most of the hospitals are. So um, I, don't, I don't have a better sense as far as how we compare, you know, are we worse or any better off than the other hospitals? I know we're all at that point at this point where well, we're strained beyond that, beyond that normal expected capacity to kind of keep it up without continued resources put applied to that or shutting down other services so that we can right. provide more COVID support. Mm -hmm. And I expect that will continue uh, through the rest of the flu season, quite honestly. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else have any questions or comments? Ms. Seelander, come on under. Come on up so we can all hear you. Oh, you should hear me. Now, <laughs> they may be different in stature here, but I don't know. I may have my money on Sharon. Well, I guess I have a question. I'd like to know the statistics on how many of these COVID cases came from eating at a restaurant or whatever, or came from maybe a family gathering. I mean, you're 
trying to shut down the restaurants to 50% from the 75. And I'm sorry, maybe I wasn't talking loud enough. But um, how many of these are actually coming from restaurants? As I was stating earlier, as I go around, Don and I go out and eat fairly often, all of the restaurants seem to be providing adequate space, adequate things in that. So I'd like to know how many actually come from restaurants. Do we know? You, can you have an answer? So, uh, so I don't have a specific answer to that. Uh, what I can tell you is that that the majority, the vast majority of these cases are are that fall within the the area of community spread rather than being able to be defined as spread from school, or work or family, and so that community spread includes restaurants, that includes shopping, um, and that and that honestly probably to some degree includes some of those family gatherings that just weren't otherwise clearly documented. Um, and so the way we, the way we categorize um, where the COVID case came from is, is we have to say there was a known case within this particular group, whether it's a family group or a work group or, or, or school group. And if it's not, then we have to just categorize it as community spread. Um, and, and that goes back to you know, how much detailed history we can get from that patient at the time they're diagnosed with COVID. So I'm sorry I don't have more specific numbers, but out of the 996 um, you know, new documented cases over the last 30 days, I can tell you that over 75% were considered community spread, which includes those restaurants, which includes, um, again, those, those community activities that we all do. So I'm sorry I don't have more specific information for you other than about 75% or more. Okay. I was just trying to find a I'll real read. stat as to why we're shutting down, or not shutting down, yeah, why we're, we're reducing. Down. Yeah, there, the only thing that's being shut down is no, elective I mean shut services down. I apologize. at the hospitals. And I was, I didn't listen to this number. Doctor, maybe you could do this, but Jay told me how many sets of PPE are used per day mm -hmm. at the hospital for, is it just treatment of COVID patients or was it elective surgery? I, my facts, what was it or both? It was just overall. What overall, the, overall, tell overall us. what they burn on a daily rate. On a daily rate, how many suits was it? Uh, they're up to 800, uh, 800 gallons a day. Yeah. 800 gallons a day. I know when my husband was in there, you know, every time a nurse or anybody walked in the room, they had on their gear, and when they left, they took it off and dis disposed of it and that. So I know they would probably go through quite a few. Um, so um, I just want to say my husband, we, con we went back to contact tracing when he got it, and it came from the emergency room. So, you know, there's a lot of places that you can now get this and that's why I was wondering about the restaurants because I've noticed that they've all been working very hard to try and stay within you know the guidelines. I, I wish I could say that they all have but that's not been my personal experience just being about the community. Most are doing a good job mm -hmm. but there, there are some that are really pushing the limits as far as individual staff or workers or et cetera. Et cetera. Ms. Brochier. My question is for you, doctor. Well, get, get to say it so that the whole county can hear you. My question is for the doctor. I wonder, can you come up with better guidelines for non-elective medical procedures? Because there are a lot of people out there that their medical procedures are being turned down and they're being put on the back burner because of COVID. And... There are people dying out there because of this. So can't they come up with some better guidelines for so-called non-essential medical procedures? Uh, I appreciate the question. Uh, the real challenge there is that um, that's, we're, we're, this is not specific to Hood County. Uh, when, when it comes to these guidelines, we're talking about national, national recommendations and Texas state level uh, recommendations, not, not from the governor specifically, but from our various uh, surgical uh, communities, right? And, and the licensing communities. So there's a very real threat to the, the medical licenses of, of surgeons and nurses and podiatrists and, and dentists and others that, that perform these procedures that if, 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 if someone makes a complaint, 
that they did something that broke the law at this time, they're, they're, literally their licenses are at stake. So, so there's a, a, a high degree of fear and concern, and folks are looking at these guidelines very, very closely and very carefully as far as what can I do, what can I not do. And if they're not sure, some of them err on the side of, you know what, I'm going to cancel it until I figure it out. So, so we recognize there's a risk. Every time I've, I've discussed this with the hospital or our Baylor Surgical Center or the dentist offices and, and others in our community that do these, I, I personally encourage them to, to put the patient's needs first and make sure that documentation clearly identifies the need for the surgery, because qu quite honestly, no surgeon, no specialist is going to recommend or do a surgery if there's not a clear medical need for it. I mean, we don't take, for instance, we don't take people's tonsils out anymore unless they've really been sick and had multiple episodes of tonsils because there's a risk of extra bleeding and complications, right? So, so this, the modern surgical world, that tends to be, you know, they tend to look at that very carefully before they ever recommend a surgery. And so as long as the documentation exists and the information is there to say, hey, we have a very critical need for this, or else I wouldn't be trying to do this in the days of COVID, then I personally believe they're covered, but I can't make that decision for them. And I can't change those recommendations because they're coming from a, a state and, and honestly a, a national level with some of these organizations. Just as I mentioned earlier, American Public Health Association has recommendations and CDC has recommendations on the spread of COVID. Well, again, these surgical organizations and, and like, they have national recommendations and then state level recommendations, and like I said, um, impact on their, their, their licenses and their certifications that some folks just don't want to take the risk right now. And I can't, I can't tell them they have to. That's between them and their patients and their staff. I'm, I'm sorry I don't have a better answer for you. Okay. But we do have those conversations and we'll continue to have those conversations. I'm happy to, to be a part. Okay, Dr. Greider. I just want to make the comment that there's also the fear, and this is a part of this, is if you overstress... I can't understand you with your mask on. I'm okay. Sorry. I can hear the dog. If you overstress the medical system, just like the firefighters on the West Coast get overstressed, then we're in real trouble, much more than we are now. And we're approaching that. Why these numbers are there is to try to avoid that. Good. Thank you, doctor. Yes, ma'am. So you scared me there about South Dakota, so I went and looked up the numbers. Um, they had 37 new hospitalizations yesterday in the state of South, that's in the entire state of South Dakota. Um, 52.9 average new total hospitalizations per day over the last seven days, that's from Johns Hopkins. Um, also, I just wanted to say that, um, you know, as you said earlier, we should really look at what the experts say. And so one of the experts that I look to is our founding fathers. And one of our founding fathers said that, Benjamin Franklin, said those who would give up essential liberty to purchase a little temporary safety deserve neither and will lose both. So that's what I wanted to leave you with is the experts of our founding fathers. And I'd like to hear from Dave Eagle, who put this on the table to see what he has to say. And thank, thank you. you. Is everybody else done so I can talk about my agenda item now? Can I add something, Dave, if you mind for a second? I, I wasn't on the list, but I've sat here and listened to The judge, it's left to the judge. He's the presiding officer here. I didn't fill out a form because I was really. Well, why didn't you fill out a form? Say again? Why didn't you fill out a form? Be because I was just wanting to observe today and then, and then once okay, all the well, options. it's almost noon, so go ahead. I'm going to let you speak. And I'll, I'll go really quick. You can even start my timer. But I've, I've listened to all this. And the decision today is going to stress economically people in our community. That's exactly what this is about, rolling it back. If you want to roll it back 50%, what the governor wants to do. We can argue all day long where the governor's order is lawful or not lawful. And that's where we're trying to guidelines here. We're going to have to follow the governor's order. But here, here's the hypocrisy that I see here. I, I see people saying six foot. I see people saying wear a mask. I see the doc over here sitting without a mask 
gets up to talk, puts his mask on, hands you a cartoon, no gloves, nothing like that, and hands that to you, puts his mask on in a room that's circulating air from here to there to here, and half, most of these people don't have masks on. If you truly were concerned about the community, truly, and not, not filling out paperwork and saying, look at the paperwork we filled out and we have two and a half million dollars now because we followed the guidelines and the rules of the governor. If you were truly concerned, you wouldn't let one person walk in this room without a mask on. You wouldn't because you're saying six foot, you're saying wear a mask, but you walk in this room and this circulation in this air is moving from air to here to there to there. And that is hypocrisy in my book, absolute hypocrisy. If you want to keep the community safe, let us do, let the people, and I'm not a business owner, but I support the business owners. You're getting ready to dial it back again to 50% for them or to close them down. You'll follow the governor's guidelines. He'll fill out the paperwork and you'll get another million dollars or $500,000. You guys are getting paid. The county's getting paid while you're rolling these people back. And technically, technically, you're exposing everybody in this room that you're not making them wear a mask. So you want to say, follow the guidelines, follow the guidelines, follow the guidelines, roll it back, roll it back, stay six foot. There's four foot between you guys. Nobody's wearing a mask up there, out here. There's a lot of hypocrisy right now. You need to think of the business owners that have been suffering for nine months with this nonsense. And you want to, you want to slap them back again. So I'm done. Thank you. You want to briefly respond to that? So if I may, I'm the doctor responding. You're going to get the last word in, Dave. Thank you. Okay. Someday I what will. What can you respond to that last gentleman's response about what can you tell us about that? If we had a scientist. Judge, judge I, don't, like, I don't have anything new to share. I mean, I've, I've already shared today. And again, I have no idea what, what conversation or communication happened before I arrived, right? I came in at the, at the tail end of this. Um, all I can say is. Good public health recommendations are good public health recommendations. I've already shared that we're dealing with human nature and per people's personal interests and desires. You know, the fact that the majority of people are not wearing masks in this room, regardless of whether they're six foot away from their neighbor or not, is, is, is just one snapshot of what's happening across the community and across every, every business and every organization. All I can tell you is when I'm contacted or I'm talking with a school district or a nursing facility or anything else. And again, I have these conversations multiple times every day, a business owner, and they say, okay, now I have a positive case and what do I have to do about it? Um, you know, I've had some recent conversations with other county and, and, and uh, you know, other offices here about just that. Okay, now I have a case, now what am I supposed to do? And my go-to is what, have, what were you doing at the time of exposure? Were, were folks minimizing contact? Were they staying six foot apart? Were they wearing masks at the time this, this, this particular documented case happened? And that drives how much or how little you have to, you're recommended to shut down at that point. Specifically in our schools, a, a student rides the bus to school, shows up to class, having, having symptoms, goes to see the school nurse after school's already started, and then they're documented with COVID. Okay, well, so who are they sitting by on the bus? Who did they eat lunch with? Who are they sitting in class next to? And were they, were they not wearing masks or staying apart when they did that, right? How many seats apart were they on the bus? How much distance? So those guidelines then come into effect. And now suddenly, people are suddenly concerned about what they have to do about it at that point. We've shut entire sports teams down because they couldn't clearly say who was interacting with who. Again, that's not my decision. That's the decision of the school leaders and the coaches and, and, and the students and parents, quite frankly, on the sports teams because they couldn't say they maintained that distancing and they wore masks. If they can say they did that, that same student who rode the bus, but they were all wearing masks, they were maintaining as much distance as possible. They did the same in class. Well, guess what? That student is out, but all the others around them are not obligated to leave school and be out of class because they followed those social guidelines. So that same, those same things are in effect for any, any school, any organization, any, any, any workplace. Again, people really don't necessarily care until somebody's sick and then they all ask me what to do. So I'm going to continue to recommend that we follow the CDC guidelines. I'm going to continue to recommend that we follow the state uh, Department of State Health Service guidelines as relates to, I'm going to continue to recommend that we follow the governor's orders, okay, because those are influenced by those guidelines and those expert opinions as relates to what we do here locally. 
then my opinion is the same. Whether you choose to follow that, that's up to you. And that's up to your family and your coworkers. Okay? And, and that's really where we stand. That's all I have on that. Thank you, Doctor. Okay. Dave Eagle. Drawing from Hamlet, the doctor doth protest too much, methinks. <laughs> now, I've got a simple, Mr. Commissioner White said we, he wishes we had a, a simple solution. And as a government entity, we do. It's found in these two documents, the state constitution and the United States Constitution, as far as the government is concerned. Now, once again, I got headed off at the pass on one of my, on my agenda item. This happened to me back in March. And I don't know what the people are afraid of hearing me say, but it was interesting that I got headed off again. But here's what I know. When they want you to wear a mask, when you walk into a restaurant, but yet when you sit down to eat, you can take it off, that's insanity. When you go through a drive through window and they take your money with their bare hands, but they hand you your drink in a little con container deal, that's insanity. When, when city leaders roll out their Granberry Love campaign about wearing a mask, yet those same city leaders dress to the nines and go to the jewel ball and not a one of them wear a mask, that's insanity and hypocrisy. When public health officials have refused to analyze new data that has mounted up over the last nine months regarding COVID-19, because they refused to sway from their narrative originally rolled out back in March of 2020, that's not only insanity in my view, but it's also a major case of cognitive dissonance. Well, what is cognitive dissonance? It's a theory in so social psychology that refers to a mental conflict that occurs when a person's behaviors and beliefs don't align. It may happen when people don't have two beliefs that contradict one another. But cognitive dissonance definitely causes tension and unease. And people attempt to relieve this discomfort by explaining things away. Or rejecting, this is the big, big, big one, or rejecting new information that conflicts with their existing beliefs. What we were told in March, this is nine months ago. COVID will double, every, for right there at that microphone, COVID will double every three days. That was told to us on March 30th, we had six cases. And if that had been true, we would have had 6,144 cases by April the 29th. And every person in this county would have been infected with COVID by May the 10th. Just do the numbers. We heard another thing from that microphone right there that, that I didn't even want to hear it when I heard it because I was hoping this would last two or three weeks when we were kind of, you know, they started out real easy with us because they didn't want to give us the, all the bad information at once. But I heard from that microphone right there that we need to think in terms of it going on for eight weeks. We're, here, we're still here nine months later with another rollout coming with a retraction of the governor's formerly released uh, or releasing of some of these restrictions. And we have heard, don't wear a mask, wear a mask. Don't wear a mask, wear a mask. Don't wear a mask, wear a mask. That comes from what I'm going to loosely define as Dr. Fauci. And that depends on what day it is that you go out there and look on YouTube and see when he said that this year. Now we've heard the term community spread, which means that means I don't know where it came from. But we also heard that we'll just suspend the Constitution just for a little while while we get this worked out, something that we've never done in the entire history of this country. And Jack Wilson knows what I think about constitutional arguments, don't, don't you, Mr. Wilson? 
And it's unbelievable to me how the federal government steals our hard-earned money and then turns around and bribes local governments to continue these draconian measures, this two and a half million bucks that I had, I don't know where it is, which account it's in, and I'm not, I'm saying this rhetorically, you don't have to tell me right now. It's in Fund 101, there you go. So let me get to this Great Barrington Declaration that Dr. Blocker says that is not based on sound medical science and is not supported by trusted public health authorities. The main author of this great document called the Great Barrington Declaration is Dr. J. Bhattacharya. I hope I pronounced that correctly. He's with Stanford Medicine. He's a professor in Southern California. He's the one that conducted the Stanford study back in April. They tested 3,300 residents of Santa Clara County, none of whom were infected with COVID, but they found out there were a lot of antibodies in the te people they tested. And their conclusion was the, the rate of infection was much higher than they were telling us at the beginning, which means that the rates, these dire 4%, 5% death rates really were not true. The study suggests that COVID-19 mor mortality rate was far lower than previously thought. And as of Tuesday, April 14th, it was much lower than was, had been previously reported to that time. Now that Stanford study, guess where it went down? It went down the tubes of Facebook and YouTube censoring it. So we couldn't see that. Now, the doctor has endorsed the John Snow Memorandum. And I think What's interesting about the John Snow Memorandum, and I've read them both, the Great Barrington Declaration came out in October the, about October the 5th is when that document was published. And they've got a website, by the way, you can go, you can Google, if, if they hadn't taken it down yet, you can Google Great Barrington Declaration and go to their website and they've got, you can look at that, you can look at who signed it, you can look at, look at why they put it in there, you can look at, uh, you know, what is it, facts, FAQ, formally, frequently, frequently asked questions. But interestingly, if you, if you kind of research that, and then I went and read the Do John Snow Memorandum, and it's, it's got a web, kind of, they've, they've done their rebuttal website, right? And that came out a few days after the, John, the Great Barrington Declaration came out. And if you read them closely, except for the conclusion one of the conclusion statements in the John Snow memo, they agree on many things. And as a matter of fact, if you want to go out there's, and look at the John Hopkins University debate, uh, they actually debated in a very, uh, in my opinion, a very uh, gentlemanly or gentlewomanly manner. It was uh, scholars and uh, from both sides of the argument. Very good, a very interesting debate. And Dr. Bacharara's opening statement to at least address one of the issues about herd immunity, he says, there's three basic premises for the declaration. There's a wide difference in infection rates and severity for people over 70 versus people under 70. He, 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 has a, he draws a line there. And that the survival rate below 70 is 99.9%. .9%. The survival rate above 70 is not that, is not, it's, I think, 95, it's a 5% uh, infection, non-survival. So it's, it is higher among the older population that is vulnerable. And they, they both, both sides acknowledge that. He says that zero COVID at this point in time is, will never be achieved, just like SARS, and we're not going to get to zero. I mean, we might as well forget that. It's something we're going to have to figure out how to live with. And his last point was herd immunity, uh, because this was one of the criticisms in the John Snow Memorandum as, was a strategy, and he said herd immunity is not a strategy. He said herd immunity is just the natural endpoint. And the question is, how do we get there? John Snow Memorandum's got the 
let's keep, let's lock, you know, let's restrict, restrict. And the Great Barrington Declaration says, let's focus on folks who are vulnerable and let non-vulnerable people go back and live their lives. <clears throat> because sooner or later we got to get to herd immunity. So hit the so the conclusion generally on the John uh, the um, Great Barrington Dec Declaration was to focus our resources that we've got on the vulnerable population. The non-vulnerable population go back to living your life and get the government out of it. Kids back in school, concert goers back to concerts, art seekers back to art galleries. And by the way, as an aside here. Well, let me back up. So, the, so again, the John Snow Memorandum in it, say, it says that it's, it's a dangerous fallacy about a herd immunity approach. And Dr. Bacharara says we're not, that's not an approach. That's just a, that's just a scientific fact at the end of the tunnel. And he's quick to point out that that statement that they made is a fallacy because there's no such thing as an approach. So. Interestingly, if you read the John Snow Memorandum carefully, they carefully craft and use a term called protective immunity. So they, they, they changed the term a little bit because they didn't want to use the word herd immunity. And then they state they don't know how long it's going to last. They don't know what, you know, they don't know a lot of things. But they do agree, John Snow itself, agrees that risk to vulnerable population is indeed more pressing, and they agree that special efforts to protect the most vulnerable are essential. So I invite all of you, if you've looked at one, to go look at the other one, certainly, because I, all I'm trying to do is get this on the table again, because we've been at this for nine months, and I'm not you know, I don't want to be heard to criticize or attack anybody. I'm just saying, I, when I saw what was coming down the pike last week about the governor is going about our percentage levels, then I thought it might be a good idea after nine months of this, when we were told it wasn't going to go on this long, to put it back on the table. And sure enough, everybody's come in to talk about it, and I appreciate that. But what's interesting. The John Snow Memorandum conclusion says that they want to continue restrictions, of course, at least in the short term, whatever that means. We, we were told short term months ago, and fix ineffective pandemic response systems. So in their own document, in their own document, they probably didn't realize this when they wrote this, but they're basically admitting that what they've done to, to date has been ineffective. And as far as the, the not based on science statement, I, I, I would hope that Dr. Blocker would rethink that. I, I've, I've pull, if you go to the Great Barrington Declaration itself and you can, you can click on the signatories, you've got, uh, I'm just gonna read five signatures. And there's 50,000 people that have, 50,000 medical practitioners, public health scientists, and medical health scientists that have signed this. This is not just me going up, Dave Eagle going and signing this, because I know you wouldn't go for that one, right? This is, this is medical professionals. Dr. Martin Kulldorff, professor of medicine at Harvard University, biostatistician, epidemiologist, with expertise in detecting and monitoring infectious disease outbreaks. Dr. Sunatra Gupta, professor at Oxford University, an epidemiologist with expertise in immunology, vaccine development, and mathematical modeling. I know Dr. Granick likes that part of it. Uh, mathematical modeling of infectious diseases. Dr. Jay Bachara, who's the author of the, the primary author, professor, Stanford Mu University Medical School, a physician, epidemiologist, health economist, and public health policy expert, focusing on infectious diseases and vulnerable populations. Dr. Alexander Walker, principal at World Health Information Science Consultants, former chief of epidemiology at Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health, 
Dr. Angus Daglish, easy for me to say, from the University of London, oncologist, infectious disease expert, and I could go on and on from all over the world, England, Canada, Germany, Israel, University of Arizona, Scotland. You can go look for yourself. Don't take my word for it. John Snow Memorandum has been signed to date about 6,900 people according to their, uh, si uh, their website yesterday, and most of them are public health officials and bureaucrats. So I'm just, make, I'm just stating the, the people that signed this. So here's my final point, and then I'll, I know you guys are tired of it. <clears throat> if we would let people go back and live their lives, you wouldn't hear me say this again. But anyway, I include provisions of the Texas Constitution in this proposed resolution because never forget that the Constitution is a big issue with all these orders. And when they first came in back in March, early Mar mid-March and April, most courts deferred to the health authorities and most people out here gave them the benefit of the doubt, even though I argued vehemently that it's unconstitutional the first time we, this came out. Most of us were going, okay, let's, you know, for a while, maybe they're, let's, let's give them the benefit of the doubt. And we did that. And I've tried to keep my mouth shut about it in court since then. When, well, actually, until when we finally got all businesses are essential passed a few weeks later. But Mr. Mills, I would ask you, and we talked about this, there is case law currently developing after nine months of this that is suggesting, just suggesting that these shutdowns are not going to fly for much longer. There's one out of Wisconsin, and there's one out of Philadelphia, or not Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, which interestingly, the swing states were having issues with the voting situation. But have you got any, have you got any comments about either one of those cases, and have you seen any others? Uh, Y'all really want to. <laughs> um, Wisconsin was a deal where the Supreme Court said that their shutdown order was uh, in violation of state law and state procedures. I don't know. That was in May. Uh, they've gone back and done other stuff since. Uh, there was a case out of Pittsburgh, Western District of Pennsylvania, that said that uh, Butler County was involved and the, the lockdown there was unconstitutional. It was a pretty scathing opinion. That's been appealed to the Third Court of Appeals, so that's still pending, and we don't know. Uh, there's been the Supreme Court in Texas that's kind of weighed in with dicta that hasn't really weighed in on point, but they say the, the Constitution is not suspended during a pandemic or some language like that. Right. Uh, we had the, the AG weigh in on my request, and he avoided most of the fundamental questions, but he said that the local orders uh, exceeded their scope under state law because they had some provisions that weren't authorized by state law. So that was partially struck down. Uh, so there, it's a <laughs> uncertain territory constitutionally and state law. And I mean, this is going all over. The Supreme Court had one, what, a week or so ago about a, a church shutdown. I haven't read that one yet. But uh, it's uncertain how this is going to end up is all I can tell you from what I've read. So the road is narrowing on us as elected officials making trying to manipulate what people do with their personal and business lives. The road is getting more narrow. And I'm recognizing that today because it is. And it's interesting to me, the, the case out of, Philadelphia, uh, out of Pennsylvania, that the lower court, this is a federal district court, as Mr. Mel, Mill said, was a scathing indictment against all these lockdowns and shutdowns, et cetera. And guess what? The local authorities on taxpayer dime appeal it. So the, the people of Pennsylvania are paying their local authorities who don't want to give up their control to appeal it all the way up to the Pennsylvania Supreme Court. And Because they're figuring if, if they keep dragging their feet, sooner or later this thing may go away, although I've heard no one give us some sort of indication as when we're going to be through with this. 
So if the commissioner's court on March the 30th, I stated that the facts do not support increased restrictions, at that time a lot of them. Number two, GA 32, which is later, and nearly all the other executive orders laid down by Abbott under his disaster declaration is on its face unconstitutional. That's not in my resolution. I'm just saying that. That's what I said on March the 30th. And I will, just about through, none of the micromanagement of individuals that they suggest doing, because the order of the governor now has basically mandated that bars close. Well, here's the problem for bar owners, the TABC. If they don't close, then they send the governor, the state of Texas can send the brown shirts in to shut them down and take away their, per their license. If that is not tyranny at the point of a gun, I don't know what is. So I will close with Dr. Roger, Roger Hudkinson's, he's the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons. He testified in, in Canada before the Edmonton Council la, uh, a few weeks ago. There is absolutely nothing that can be done to contain this virus other than protecting older, vulnerable people. It should be thought of as nothing more than a bad flu season. This is not Ebola. This is not SARS. It's politics playing medicine, and this is a very dangerous game. There is no action of any kind needed at this other than what happened last year when we felt unwell. We stayed home. We took chicken noodle soup. We visited Granny when we were not sick. And we decided we would return to work when we decided we felt good enough to do that and we're not contagious anymore. We did not need anyone to tell us that. I'm done, besides my resolution. Okay, do I hear a motion regarding the resolution adopting the Great Barrington Declaration? I'll make that motion. A motion is made by Commissioner Eagle to adopt the resolution adopting the Great Barrington, Barrington Declaration in Hood County, Texas. Do I hear a second? Motion fails for lack of a second. That's it. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. This meeting is adjourned.